Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 151. So glad you could join me. Uh, today's guest is Troy Jallimore. He'll be here in just a little bit. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle's a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. Uh, we just love poetry, and if you love poetry as much as we do, please make sure you click the like button and subscribe and share. Um, the like buttons really help. Last week's episode um, on, f- on YouTube had about twice as many views um, as everybody else, or as the recent videos, um, well over 1,000 now. And I checked back, and it was this one hour where we, uh, we had like 500 views, and the, the length of time watching was still over an hour, so we had people actually watching. It must have been because we were on the sidebar related to some other video. And uh, the more you click the like button, the more we get on the sidebar and you get like hundreds of extra people uh, being exposed to great poetry. So please make sure you click something. Uh, No matter what platform you're watching, it always works that way. Suggestions come by clicking stuff. So click stuff. Um, And now we're going to go to uh, our Poets Respond Poets for the week first. And uh, today's poet, or Sunday's poet, I should say, um, is the first uh, uh, haiku we've written uh, in a long time for uh, Poets Respond. And um, here the poet is, uh, Joshua Eric Williams. Hey, Josh. Yeah, so glad you could join us. Uh, so uh, why don't you start out, just because uh, it's a haiku, why don't you just read it first, then we'll talk about it after you read it. Sure, I'd love to. Silent after the shooting stars. Silent after the shooting stars. Yeah, and that was uh, and and the, that was about, of course, all the um, the mass shootings that are going on right now, and um, and it's the second time we've had a, a haiku as the poet respond poem, and I just thought this was so brilliant for the way that it operates. I mean, it's it's a it's one of those it's such a heartbreaking, difficult story to even think about and write about, um, and every you know everybody has the same kind of thoughts about it, just the horror of the world in which this happens over and over and over again. Um, and so containing it in such a small five-line haiku um, is just a wonderful thing to do. How did, how did this poem come to be? Well, so the Uvalde shooting, the Highland Park shooting, all of these mass shootings, uh, just that they happen in such frequency that it's never off my mind. And so um, it was just a matter of time before uh, it coalesced into a poem um, about it. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to layer um, different ways of looking at the world, but the shooting is still framed within those experiences, mm-hmm. um, if that makes sense. And so I, I paid close attention to uh, the ways that uh, the ways the words could be uh, read and um, also the way uh, one could read the poem. And uh, it just happened to click in the right way that uh, uh, you get multiple poems out of one poem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly what great haiku just tend to do, which is get that sense of simultaneity within like the multiverse or something, like everything all at once. Um, it sort of captures how infinitely complicated human experience really is and like distills it into a nugget in an instant that's really like five or a hundred different instants. And so just how you read this poem um, changes. I mean, there, there's so many different ways to even read it just based on the pauses um, of where how you treat those line breaks, which are not punctuated. So silent after, well, do you want to read it a few different ways? And maybe we can talk about that after you, if you do that. Sure, sure. Um, so I, what I'll do is I'll just read, uh, recite different ways. Um, silent after the shooting stars. Silent after the shooting stars. Silent after the shooting stars. Yeah, silent yeah. after the shooting stars. I thought you had them all. But yeah, there's just so many ways to read that and look at that. And um, and the other thing that's fascinating too is the way um, that stars kind of feels as you're anticipating what's coming next. You get the sense of start, you know. So it's mm-hmm. like shines after the shooting starts almost too. So there's a whole bunch of ways to read that, and it gets that just that sense of I can't remember what the word is to call it. The um, there's a word in the Japanese um, that, that's just this sense of kind of sublime awe. Um, do you remember, do you know what that word is? Do you know what I'm thinking of? I'm trying to. What trying is it? To... It's Richard Gilbert talks about it, but it has that sense of um, you know that just that you get a little goosebump feeling because of that. Oh, the haiku moment. Yeah. Well, there's a word for it though, but I can't remember the. Uh, but it is the haiku moment is is how we tran you know uh, uh, translates it. Um, but you get that feeling, and it's because of the the ways you know 
I don't know, it captures both the the silence after a big event and like the inability of what to say. It captures the actual physical silence after like the deafening kind of ring of something traumatic that happened to you. It also captures the uh, indifference of the stars, you know? I mean, you know, life goes on completely does not care, you know, the Beetle J doesn't care if there's a mass shooting here. It's just going to continue to do what it does, you know, seven million light years away or however far away. Um, and so it puts all that into one little nugget of a haiku, which I just, I just, it's one of my favorite haikus I've seen in a long time. So, um, yeah, thanks for sharing this. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. It's good to see you. It's been a while too. Absolutely. Bye. Bye. Yeah, so that was uh, Joshua Eric Williams with uh, yesterday's poem, a haiku, Silent After the Shooting Stars. And now we're going to go to tomorrow's poet, uh, John Ammon. Um, hey, John, how you doing? Doing well. Uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, another poet. This is a day of uh, poets I haven't seen in a long time. I saw you at Beyond Baroque once. We met um, mm-hmm. way back when. Yep. I remember you played guitar as well as, uh, <laughs> yeah. as, well as did poems. Um, <laughs> so, so we have this poem, Interdependence Day. Um, and, it, and I loved it because it wasn't about all the topics that we were talking about. That's one of the things that was just great, because we have this sort of rut we get into where we feel like in uh, Poets Respond in that series, you have to write about the big events. And this is something that, you know, a smaller event inspired a lot of thought about. Do you want to explain uh, what this poem, Interdependence Day, was about? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, th- first off, there's the, there were, yeah, there was sort of the... Um, well, there's, there's a confluence of things, and I was sort of trying to get at some sense of connectivity between these various trajectories, if you will. Um, at the heart of it uh, is something that's always fascinated me, and that was, that's, that's my, my grandfather's sort of fascination with Elvis. Uh, I, you know, I, I was relatively young when he died, so I never really got to ask him about it. I wish I, I, wish I could have, but that was sort of at the heart of it is, is this strange relationship he had with Elvis when Elvis died. Um, so that, that was sort of at the, at the heart of the poem. What, what, um, what maybe did Elvis represent for him? Mm-hmm. Uh, who, who, who was, who was a, a Jewish man who fled Europe before World War II erupted? Um, and, and had family that didn't get out. Um, so, so around his story is is also this this story of you know the World War II, also the budding stock market. Um, there's a lot of different uh, elements like that coming coming together. So, so just trying to sort of get at um, how multifaceted you know a life can be and um, and how these things that that don't necessarily seem to be related on on, on some level really can be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, why don't so um, people know what we're talking about? Why don't we? Uh, can you read the poem Interdependence Day? Sure. Love to. Thanks. <clears throat> Interdependence Day, July fourth. My maternal grandfather. Born in 1896, and who didn't know rock and roll from a Christmas carol, framed the paper, that loud black headline blaring from his office wall. Elvis Presley is dead. Mizrahi Jew who fled Europe with his wife and kids in 38, he clocked for the rations board, basking in that blue chip fountain, the stock market of the 1960s. My grandparents didn't own any of Elvis's albums. Their music collection consisted of a single LP, Nina Simone's debut, a gift from one of their kids that probably seemed appropriate given that Simone grew up in Tryon, the same town where they lived, albeit on the other side of the Red River, across train tracks, past the cop station, in the gully, where floodwaters pooled every time it rained. Nina fled Tryon as soon as she could, wrapping herself in a neon gown, overdosing on jazz chords. 
She died by an open window in a spaceship flying to the sun, dreaming of one final concert, an electric piano that floated in the dark. My grandfather's sister died in a concentration camp in 44. My mother says that most meals, the ghost woman sat grimly at their table, flashing her tattooed arm as often as she could. Elvis ate fried food and took sleeping pills. The last 10 years of his life, he gained 180 pounds. He was my grandfather's American son who tossed his hips for a moonlit moment while in Tryon, we waited in our trucks for the Northern Suffolk to pass. Baptism, burial, a lifetime flashes before that caboose finally arrives. My grandfather, safe among the magnolia trees, died on his back porch, 1980, roses in blossom, heart bursting as he stared into a wisteria hedge. You could almost hear Nina's jazz chords writhing in the grass. Steam coiled above the Red River, the northern Suffolk carved across the mountainside. A month after his service, I helped my grandmother pack boxes. He adored the king, she said, glancing at the 77 headline. And I figure that on some level, what she said had to be true though I don't think my grandfather could have named one Elvis song if his sister's life depended on it. And it probably did. And that was Interdependence Day. Uh, it's going to be Tuesday's poem, uh, rattle.com. Um, and, and that that last, it's just such a great journey, weaving the different stories together. And that last line, um, and it probably did, calling all the way back and making you realize why um, the, the title is what it is. Can you explain a little bit about that, about where that... What's the meaning of the title in the last line, how they fit through the poem? Yeah, I mean, I, I think some of the connections, you know, in the course of the poem are a little easier to make. Um, the one at the end is sort of more of a, a stretch, almost like that a, a riff on that idea of a butterfly flaps its wings, you know, in one place, you know, something, it, it affects something miles away um and in this case even sort of in, in terms of like multiple lives or parallel lives things like that um so yeah just just again getting at that that um connectivity um that uh you know some of which is is clear and others it's, it's just a little more um it, it's maybe harder to to get at but but still worth considering yeah, just a wonderful, thought-provoking poem. Thanks for sharing that, John. And uh, and you're the editor of Pedestal Magazine, um, which, um, how is that going? I think you had a, didn't it go on hiatus for a little bit, and now it's back? No, we've uh, we've been going. Um, we're, uh, December will be uh, 21 years. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so um, we uh, a couple times had less issues, but um, but we've always... Uh, been at least uh had it had at least two issues a year mm -hmm. um since we started so yeah we're we're still going pretty pretty strong now actually we've got a pretty good staff and uh, we just posted a new issue um on june uh 21st so um yeah i saw yeah. that it was one of those things where my uh you know facebook and twitter were flooded with people being uh, in, the, in that issue it looks like a great issue um is there anything yeah. you want to tell people about like submitting or, or anything about about pedestal magazine Sure. I mean, you know, we're always open to uh, to receiving uh, good poetry. Um, we tend to have two windows, um, like like. Um, well, actually, we're gonna have four windows now. Um, so, I mean, if you go on the on the uh, website, the pedestalmagazine.com, you'll you'll see the um, submission periods. Um, usually, um, for the June issue, we're open all May. May for the December, all in November. And then we're, we're just now starting to have five day submission periods between the two. So March and September. Um, and, you know, we're just always, yeah, we're always interested in, in uh, good poetry and, and different kinds of poetry. Um, and, uh, you know, just really, uh, just really getting good work these days. So, you know, there's, there's obviously a lot of good work uh, going on and 
right now with poetry. Yeah, for sure. It's a golden age, I think. And it, yeah. And it, the Pedestal Magazine has always been just one of the best online, um, you know, journals around. So, so glad um, that you keep it up and, and keep doing it. It's great. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, definitely. And that was John Eamon. And uh, you can find The Pedestal Magazine at The Pedestal, P-E-D-E-S-T-A-L, thepedestalmagazine.com. So check that out. The new issue just released a bunch of names you'll recognize because um, a lot of people from my Facebook friends list, which means it's poetry published as well. Um, you know, Martha Salato's here and uh, Carrie Ralston and Julia B. Levine, Luke Johnson, um, Alexis Rome Fancher, um, Douglas Cole, a whole bunch of people that we've published in Rattle. You'll really love Pedestal Magazine, so do check that out. Um, okay, we're going to go to a quick break. And... Uh, Then we're going to get to our main guest, Troy Jollymore. So hang tight, and I will be back. And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. As I mentioned, today's guest is Troy Jallimore. Troy is the author of four books of poetry and three books of philosophy, as well as numerous articles, essays, and reviews. His first collection of poetry, Tom Thompson in Purgatory, won the National Book Critics Circle Award in Poetry in 2006. His third, Syllabus of Errors, appeared in the New York Times list of best poetry books, uh, published in 2015. His most recent, which is right here, is Earthly Delights from uh, Princeton University Press. Um, he's currently a professor in the philosophy department at San or California State University, Chico. He's also appeared in Randall about four times, I think, and um, was the interviewee in the Love Poems issue, which is a, a popular, I don't know if there's many copies of that left, but it's a great interview in that issue. Um, Troy has a lot of book, a book and a lot of essays on um, the philosophy of love, too. Here he is, Troy Jallimore. Hey, Troy, great to see you. Hey, Tim. Nice to see you. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, my pleasure. It was so cool to, to get this book in the mail. I just love, I, I love being an editor, so I get books um, in the mail. Do you want to uh, start out by reading a poem? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I should and, remind you, because I didn't before, to uh, say the page number so I can flip to it before you uh, Right. Great. I'm going to start with page one. Okay. So uh, page one, big page one. Because uh, the book, you know, opens with an invocation to the muse, and uh, it, I, I've been since I've started reading from the book. I generally open my readings with that poem, and then after that, I go in various directions. But I like starting with, hey, "You got to invite the muse in, you know, otherwise nothing good happens." So, I'll start with the poem called "Muse." Muse, wear me like clothing. Fade into my skin as I unfurl for you, like an oyster shell or a work shirt bleached by sunlight. I've hung on the line for so long here under the moon to make this dark space inside where a song can suffer and grow. Mouth, mouth, move against me. You will sing and then you will sing, then you will go. Then I will sing, then I will sing and then go. Yeah, that was Muse, which is kind of the, the introductory poem to Earthly Delights, kind of sets up the the narrative. And and it's a book, it, you know, usually before the show, I breeze through these books in like a half an hour. Um, this book, it's, it's rich um, and kind of hard to wrap your mind around. Like you don't you don't do any uh, make it easy for, um, you know, f- you know, you don't leave easy conclusions on the table, I guess you could say. Um, how would you c- characterize? I mean, to me. You know, it's one of those books where it, it stimulates a lot of thinking, and it, to me, it felt like um, 
you know, about the, um, I don't know, the, 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 where, where happiness is positioned on the American landscape, maybe. I guess you could say it that way. I mean, the, of course, the title refers to um, Bosch's Earthly Delights, the, the, or the Garden of Earthly Delights, that, that famous triptych um, about decadence or however you want to want to characterize it. I, don't th- I think nobody knows, right, um, what it's actually about. There's a, a lot of interpretations, but no history or title, right? Isn't the title something that we invented later, I think? I didn't know that, but I would well, not be surprised. Yeah, it might be completely wrong. I might have just made that up, but I make up <laughs> stuff a lot on this show. But uh, but how would you characterize like the the theme and, and overall meaning of the book? Yeah, it's it's funny. You know, the author in some ways is the last person you should ask, right? Because <laughs> you know they they've lived with it for so long and seen so many different versions of it that by the time it, it's done, they they have no idea in a way what it's about. It, it's funny the whole book writing process because of course. You know, the retrospective view is one thing, but when you're in the thick of it and you're just writing these poems, there, there's so little control with writing poems. Mm-hmm. And, and by that, and that's true of writing in general, but even more so, I think, with poems. That is, I don't feel that I can sit down and say, I'm going to write a love poem and a love poem comes out, or I'm going to write a political poem and I end up with a good political poem. I mean, how often does that happen anyway? So I've never really intended to write any sort of particular book because it, it's out of my control. I don't know what's going to happen. And so for me, at least, finding out what the book is, the only way to do that is to write it and see what happens. Mm-hmm. And then you have to sort of decode it in a way. You have to sort of figure it out. Like, well, yeah, you know, what's it about? What title am I going to give it? What? Because, of course, the title is going to make people see it in such different ways. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'd called it, I had originally had a much darker title for this book. And, and certain people, including my wife, talked me out of it. And, and finally, I decided they were probably right. And uh, I mean, it was such a dark time. But who needs a dark book in a dark time? You know, why not accentuate delight instead when things are really difficult? And it's not as if delight is frivolous. And I think maybe that's one of the things I was really thinking, as I, especially in the later stages when the book was coming together and I started to feel like I didn't know it was about that we may have an image of delight as just being very trivial, you know, delights and like pleasures or something. And I mean, even pleasures, I think, aren't necessarily trivial. And certainly I don't think delight is. I think there's something very valuable and maybe very spiritual about genuine delight. I I think delight is an attitude. It's becoming harder and harder for people to achieve. And I think that's a real loss. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, at the very beginning, I've got this little, uh, the two lines from Keats, so the epigraph to the book, uh, where he links delight and melancholy, right? And that's, I mean, that's such a Keatsian thing, but I think it's it, its completely accurate that you don't get one without the other. One of the reasons that delight is, is deep and profound in a way is because it always is linked with some form of melancholy. Mm-hmm. And, and we see this in Keats's poems over and over, you know, the, the, the happier and the more joy we feel in any given moment, it, immediately we start to think about our own mortality because it reminds us that, oh, this isn't gonna last forever. And oh, this is so great, ah, but it all has to go away, right? It's always that constant, you know, back and forth between the two poles of delight and melancholy. And, and so I felt like, you know, I, I chose the sort of positive title instead of the negative title, um, but they're both very present. I feel like this book moves back and forth between a positive charge and a negative charge, you know, constantly within the same poem, often even within the same line. So, so maybe that's my best initial stab at saying what I think the, the book is about. Uh, and I agree with you, you know, there's a lot in there. It's kind of hard to sum up. It ended up being kind of a grab bag in some ways, a, a whole bunch of poems. Well, the thing, uh, it, it feels very thematic. It really feels like you, gro- like, like groping hard around understanding something that's just out of reach. And it made me think a lot, you know, I mean, you're a, f- a philosopher too. I mean, you write books on, on philosophy, which are, you know, argumentative type essays or, you know, you know that, that kind of form where you're using logic and thinking things through. And it feels like, the, the Book of Poems was trying to get at something that you couldn't get at through that rational kind of interrogation. Um, and so, the, if, it, you know, it, it's a kind of book that I, I mean, you know, when I say it was rich and like a struggle to get through, I mean, like, I wanted to read it like three times and I only had two hours. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so it was one of those things. And I feel like, you know, like really like reaching, you know, into the chaos of human experience to make some connection. And there's some connection there, too. I think the... Um, the thing that stands out to me that I wanted to like think through the book again through that frame is that one poem where you talk about how if you looked at the at the Bosch painting backwards, it would be going. You know, the Garden of Delight has the opposite meaning. You know, we assume it's red left to right, um, but if it's red right to left, it's the opposite 
sort of timeline, which changes the entire causal chain and the meaning of the whole thing. And, and sort of, you know, in a way, both those things exist simultaneously, um, you know, because time is sort of an illusion that the arrow of time and all that stuff. So, so um, there's just some complicated thoughts here that, that really apply to our regular lives because the poem pulls in so many movies and so much about, you know, popular culture and things that are in the world around us. Um, you know, it's just the kind of book that I wanted to read a bunch of times is what I was trying to say. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Happy to hear it. Um, so let's, let's hear another poem so people get a, a better sense of what's going on in the book. Yeah, so, so the muse poem sort of exists before the book proper begins in the sense it's the floating poem at the beginning and then section one begins with this poem, Marvelous Things Without Numbers. So this is page five. Um, and uh, I feel like the book kind of has three beginnings and, and this is the second of the three beginnings. So Marvelous Things Without Number. After 40 or so summers, you kind of get the idea, the slow deepening of the plum blue dusk that offers a backdrop for the stately silhouettes of disconsolate, sentinel-like telephone poles, the fading chorus of evening bird song, the sharp hollow pong of an aluminum bat making contact with the ball somewhere off in the distance, followed by the joyful and at the same time somehow mildly forlorn minor uproar of a clutch of children cheering. Eventless days at the beach, the scorched sand stinging beneath your feet, the sand in your clothes and your hair, a relentless ubiquitous grit that remains undislodged after any number of, of showers and shampooings. The familiar dirt that collects underneath your fingernails and your hair growing longer. Careless afternoons endured and discharged in the backyard hammock or a languid folding chair by the lake, reading Amy Clampett, reading Rilke. Teenagers playing an eternal game of monopoly or risk that might well be the very same game they started last summer. The same hummingbirds taking the same flight paths back to the endless empty abundance of the same backyard uh, flowers and feeders. Some friends are renewing their vows. They were married a decade ago. Some friends are driving up to one of the casinos on Friday to hear a tribute band who have modeled themselves after Led Zeppelin or Journey. A friend who left for the East Coast two years ago has flown back to Chico to take photos of Mount Lassen exactly 100 years after its catastrophic eruption. For a while, it feels as if everything is a reenactment of something that has already happened. Even dumping a skitter of raisin bran into a bowl and then pouring milk over it, or sitting on the porch or trying on sneakers takes on the aura of a ritual. Are you trying to deny time and change? To say that death will have no authority here? Or are you celebrating the fact that everything is in flux and ungraspable? Or is the season doing one or the other of these things for you? Mornings glow like dreams, like memories, with a radiance that has been lying latent in the earth all night. You can do it again, whatever it is, but you can't do it over. The beautiful girl kissed can't be unkissed, and who would want that anyway? But you might. And so you repeat, 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 feeling rich with existence and time and a kind of exhaustion you have learned to savor. The end of side B, after all, simply means that you flip the record over and listen to side A again. And did you say that life would always be this way? Or would you, were you told that by someone in the past and now hang on to that belief in the face of what must be mounting, but for now still invisible evidence to the contrary? Stay invisible, you say to it. Stay, you whisper. Stay just as you are, just a little bit longer. Which is just another way of telling the story you tell the children every night. How the birds and the rivers remembered the songs, even when the people forgot. And how, when the people regained the ability to remember, they learned the songs again from the birds and the rivers. The children's wide, trusting eyes as you say this, as if what you said was, to use the phrase we used to like to use, the gospel truth. It's only a story after all. You mean no harm. No one means any harm. The world is ancient, full of shades and spirits, not all of them friendly, and we do with it what we can. And that was Marvelous Things Without Number. Um, it's a good example of the way the, the, the poems in the or poems in the book move. They kind of, um, you know, reveries on 
you know, certain concepts moving through, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of detail and a lot of, uh, a lot of references to, to things in our lives. Um, it, one of the things that it feels to me like there was a, um, maybe the, another way I was thinking about like characterizing the book was maybe the search for meaning within happiness and the relationship between meaning and happiness. Um, um, what can you say about that? Um, is, is happiness, um, an emptiness without meaning or can, can happiness for itself have value? Mm. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's always this tendency in philosophy to try to give definitions of things and, you know, what is the, what is the definition of happiness? What is the essence of happiness? And, and maybe one of the good things that's, that happened in the last few decades of philosophy is that we've started to resist that to some degree and say with something like happiness, well, you know, there's so many different kinds and maybe there's nothing true in general we can say about all happiness. And so I think that maybe there is a kind of happiness that is a kind of emptiness, emptiness, as you said, like that, that seems like a plausible suggestion to me. There's a kind of happiness, maybe it's what the Buddhists are after, you know, they're trying to empty themselves out through meditation. Although I think most of them say, well, it's not happiness we're after, you know, it's something else, but I don't know. It seems like that kind of thing might make you happy in a legitimate sense. And, but then I think there's other forms of happiness that are very much contrary to that, very detail oriented and gritty and engaged with the details of the world. You know, you mentioned that that poem, like a lot of the book, but I think this poem in particular, you're right, is filled with particulars and, and particular names of people and places and, and bands, you know, and so on. And, and that's important to me and particular sounds, you know, like at the beginning, that, that sound of the the, the aluminum bat hitting the ball, which for me is such an evocative sound that I wanted that. I'm hoping that that communicates something to the reader and, you know, puts them in the same kind of what mental atmosphere or emotional aura that, that I'm in as I, as I think about the poem and, and perhaps when I was writing it was in. And so there's a kind of happiness to that, a nostalgic kind of happiness that again has a, has a melancholy to it. If, thinking about, you know, playing baseball when I was a kid and that I haven't played baseball for years, but I loved it when I was a kid, right? There was so much joy in that, that kind of innocent joy that you become an adult. And I think part of your life is just trying to figure out where can I find joy like that? You know, how can I feel that happy again in, a, in, a, in an irresponsible way that just isn't worried about anything or anxious about, you know, have I earned it? What's going to happen next? You know, what if the person next to me isn't happy? Like all these crazy things that we think that, that easily erode that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, happiness is just full of paradoxes and contradictions. I think it's so hard to be happy. And I'm also not convinced we should be happy all the time because it can be very dangerous. And I think some people are too happy or happy in the wrong way. <laughs> and it, it blinds them or it distracts them from what they should be worrying about. And yet at the same time, I think so many people, maybe n more now than, than has been the case for some time, are very unhappy. And, and partly it's because of things that are not in their control at all and just the conditions of the world. And, and I think partly it's because we're, just as we're doing a very poor job right now of, of teaching critical thinking and teaching poetry and, and teaching history, I, I think we're doing a very poor job as a society of teaching people how to be happy. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I think those things are related, honestly. I, I think there's a connection between those things. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I mean, that, that we're, we're not teaching people how to be happy. There's just no doubt about that. We're the, probably the most miserable, uh, you know, for all we have, you know, all the earthly delights. We're some of the most miserable people in the history of the planet, I think. Um, I got to tell you one thing just funny about that poem, though. As I was reading it, literally, my son, we'd got a, he got a net, a uh, baseball net for his birthday. And he had a, has a T and he's just whacking the ball over and over again. So as I was reading that poem, I was literally hearing whack. And then he'd you know, pick up the next ball and whack. <laughs> it was just, and that is, you know, can you imagine for an hour doing, you know, that, you know, one thing over and over again. And like the, somehow the, the, somehow that's happiness, though, you know, there's not another care in the world, you know, yeah. and maybe that's the definition of happiness is like the lack of the lack of anxiety, like you said. But mm -hmm. I mean, I couldn't sit there and hit a ball a hundred times in a row for an hour without worrying about what I wasn't doing, you know, yeah. and, but, but he can, you know, and I don't know. It's just a, I don't know. I mean, there's so much about that, but. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't want to over romanticize mm -hmm. childhood for sure. Cause it's a very difficult place to be in a lot of ways, but I do see that sort of ability that many children have to just be naturally happy and spontaneous and find joy in things and just respond to things spontaneously without worrying about, you know, what are people going to think if I say this as opposed to that? Mm -hmm. and, and that goes away at a certain point, but up to that point, it's, it's, there's a lovely purity to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, um, 
just to, to move to something else a little bit, um, th- from your interview in, in Rattle 43, um, one of the things that I always reference on the show, many times I have, is uh, where you, t- you were talking about toward the end about political poems. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you said that you're, you're just not really drawn to political poems because um, you know, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of value in saying that your morals are good, the good morals and aren't we all having good morals together. And um, I, I'm paraphrasing. I can't remember exactly how you put it. But, um, <laughs> but it feels like this book is very political, um, but in the way of, of exploring, examining, and trying to understand mm-hmm. things. And was that an intent to have a political sort of book? It. Yes and no. I mean, it, it was it was intentional on some subconscious, unintentional level. I think you know that living in these times in this country, you just have to be thinking about this stuff. There's no avoiding it. Uh, so of course, it's going to come out somehow. And and so I think to some degree, uh, I, I think there's a lot of poems in this book that are not overtly political, but maybe surreptitiously political. And then there's a smaller number, just a handful, but they are, I think, overtly political. And I think to some degree, it was a combination of me sort of relaxing my, or letting go of my hesitations, letting go of that anxiety about writing political poems. You know, well, what if it doesn't make sense 10 years from now? What if it doesn't speak to an audience now? Well, whatever, you know, you can't worry too much about that stuff, right? Let it go. And then also partly a matter of me figuring out how to write political poems I could feel okay about because it wasn't hopefully just a matter of, here's how virtuous I am, applaud me and then applaud yourselves because clearly you're on my side, right? Which, which you know, many political poems, that's the danger of them. It's hard to avoid that. And, and yeah. that's why it's so hard to write a good one. Yeah, just to draw um, an line on that. I mean, the reason why I bring it up all the time is because, you know, for Poets Respond, we get 200 or so poems a week, yeah. 150 yeah. maybe or like that. And there's just very little you can do with that. You know, I mean, it just doesn't add anything to the discussion. Like it's it's trying to find something new and a different way of looking at things that is what political poems should be if they're going to have any any value, in my opinion, too, which I think you put really well. I think that's really true. And I think, uh, you know, so I'm not drawn to most political poems, but when a good one comes along, it just knocks my socks off. Like, I'll mention two what I think are brilliant political poems. Um, Frederick Seidel has a poem called Kill Poem, which is the first poem in his book, Uga Booga, which is an incredible poem. Uh, and, and, and I, but I couldn't say exactly what it's about. Like, it's not giving us a message, right? And that's part of the reason why it works so well. There's, you can't boil it down to a message. It, it's, it's a drama and, and the, these amazing things are, are dramatized and this incredible music and the images are unbelievable. Just an amazing poem. And then James Fenton, this is from a while ago now, but James Fenton has, I always use this as an example of a political poem that totally works. This poem called Jerusalem, which is about the, uh, the, the Middle East situation, which is as relevant now as it was, uh, two or three decades ago, probably at least three actually when he wrote it. And, and it's more or less a dialogue, but you can't always tell exactly who it is that's speaking or when it switches from one person to the other, or even if there's only two people, you know. So there's a lot of mystery in it. And again, it, it doesn't reduce to a message and there's no you know, high sentiments or here's my virtue or anything of the sort. Uh, it, it's like a little play in a way, but a very mysterious play, because again, you don't really know who's speaking or all the context. And it's just fantastic. So those are the models I look at. And those are the poems I think about. Whenever I, I slip into the mode of thinking, oh, you can't do a good political poem. And I go and read those. And I come away refreshed thinking, oh, you, I mean, well, not that I can, but you know, James Fenton can and Frederick Seidel can. So at least it can be done. Right? So that's something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let, let's uh, do another poem. Uh, make sure we yeah. get to a good number of them. Yeah, oh, yes, yeah, right. Yeah, don't let me go on too much. Um, <laughs> I'm going to read this one called Andre Gregory Said. So it's on page 19. Um, It's another poem sort of about movies, although not as officially. There's a lot of poems about movies in this book. I think you mentioned that. And and I think some of these poems, certainly this one, are about art and life and the relation between the two, which is just something that obsesses me. So so Andre Gregory, maybe some people don't know. um, He is a New York uh, theater director, uh, has done some amazing work, uh, best known to many people for being the Andre in the film, My Dinner with Andre. Uh, And the other guy, the main guy in that film, Wallace Shawn, is the person having dinner with Andre. Um, And this poem actually does come out of that film because it's based on something that his character, also called Andre Gregory, says in that film. Andre Gregory said that he wanted to put a human head in a play from a corpse, that is to say, as a way of making the audience feel that this was real. 
lives being lived out and brought to an end on this very stage, which all the worlds, uh, as we know, not merely set and struck to present a passing show, to have us pass it around, fresh death in our hands, to see if we can withstand an art that cleaves so tightly to things as they are, if one can stand another skull so near one's own, one on, one off, one live, one not, one more performance of the plot, if one can withstand its demands, that's never quite the same one night to the next. So there is no question of owning, but only of being present, or rather of having been, and the having been having been followed by a quick exit pursued by a fill in the blank each actor's pursuer uniquely his, each audience member dismembered in her own manner, death by silence, death by moonlight, death by monologue. What doesn't kill you kills another. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What doesn't kill you now kills you tomorrow, takes just that much longer. That was uh, Andre Gregory said, again, from uh, Earthly Delights by Troy Jallimore. Um, if anybody has any questions for Troy, I'm watching on uh, YouTube and Facebook, so please leave your questions there. I will pass them along. Um, so, I don't know, just about, about political poems and about looking for you know, the search. I feel like this book is a very much a, a searching, trying to understand something. Um, um, what do you think is wrong with us? <laughs> Can I just say that? Like, like, do you have any theories about what is going off the rails and, and what the source is? What is wrong? But we're going to need several hours to cover <laughs> that, Tim. We do not have the time. Um, what is wrong with us? There. Well, <laughs> I mean, there's what is wrong with us in this particular society, right? And then there's sort of what is wrong with us as human beings. Mm -hmm. And they're obviously related questions, but I, I think there are particular things wrong with us in this culture. Um, we have a very impoverished notion of happiness, again, to go back to that. We, we put it in such materialistic terms, which is absurd. Uh, you know, study after study shows there, there's been great work by the psychologists in the last few decades on happiness. And, it, one thing that has clearly been confirmed is that uh, getting more money for most people isn't going to make them a lot happier. Uh, you know, if you if you don't have food, if, if you don't have your basic needs met, then yes, money actually is incredibly effective for making people happier. So the money should basically go to the people who don't have the basic needs met because that's where it does good. But once that happens, giving a person a second car, or a bigger house, whatever, it doesn't make people happier. It just it's very ineffective. And yet we we don't have any other idea of happiness. You know, most people don't. Uh, and, and I do think that that, again, is connected with the fact that we don't think as a society that it's important to teach people literature, to teach people history, to, to give them a grounding in their own culture. I mean, how are people going to have any kind of a sense of meaning and purpose if, if they don't know their own culture and they don't know what was happening in the world, you know, 20 years ago? I mean, that, that's insane. And yet that's true of most people in this country right now, I think. So, so there's that. That's, that's part one. <laughs> um, and, and that is partly enabled by, you know, some very deep problems with the human brain that, that we, we are sort of designed to uh, think in the near term and not be very good at long term thinking, which clearly Americans generally are not, and to go for flashy things and to be very status obsessed and, and also designed to put our credence in the wrong places so that we don't trust reliable people, but we trust people who we take to be relatives or like ourselves or whatever. And so we'll get millions of people who feel like, you know, they can listen to some crazy person on, on YouTube or wherever. It could be any, I mean, we're on YouTube, I realize, so not everyone on YouTube is crazy, but there's crazy people all over the place saying crazy things, you know, the, the, the pandemic was planned and QAnon and whatever. And they, they've come to the conclusion that these people are trustworthy for some reason, you know, because uh, I, I mean, there, there's various stories about exactly how that works. Uh, there's a wonderful philosopher named uh, Thien Nguyen who, who has some great articles and he talks, in, for instance, about false clarity mm -hmm. and how human beings crave false clarity. And so they crave and, and they're drawn to conspiracy theories because conspiracy theories give a sense of false clarity. They explain things. You know, we have this complicated world. Why are these things happening? And somebody gives you the conspiracy theory. It's like, oh, it made sense. It actually, it's not some assemblage of ram, random events, right? It makes sense. Mm -hmm. It feels good to believe that. But of course, it's false. 
So the human brain is just sort of badly designed by evolution, you know, to function poorly in the kind of social environments that we have. Uh, and so people end up believing all sorts of crazy things, which is, is driving us all nuts and, and is doing incredible harm. So, you know, there's much more I could say, but I mean, th those are some things that are wrong with us that I think are very, very, very bad. Yeah. As I was reading the book, I mean, two other books kept popping into my mind, which was um, the uh, there's a book I read a long time ago called I think it was called um, Consuming the Romantic Utopia. But it was about how all of our sort of mythologies and um, and and. And, and just behaviors like what we train young people growing up all has to do with with consumerism, you know, and it's all like it's like, you know, we, we threw out God and replaced God with advertising executives. <laughs> and like this is the result of, of, you know, of that for for 80 years. And, um, so, you know, so just the whole dating rituals are all about, you know, picking her up in a nice car and dressing a certain way and then going out on a date where you spend money on this. And there's all these you know, you know, money rituals, which just actually are ways to make you spend money, you know, and, and then, you know, and after 9-11, George Bush says, you know, go spend money or whatever, fight the depression and the terrorists by spending money, you know, and, and so it's just all that, that that's like the, the God of money, you know, through how well advertising preys on the human brain and all our frailties and our <laughs> misunderstandings. Um, and, and then the other one I thought of a lot of is, uh, was uh, bowling alone, um, yeah. you know, which is just kind of, you know, that's what replaces actual connection and, and you know, the depth of, of lives that, that we're kind of missing. Everyone's craving. There's so much loneliness in the world today because we have so much stuff that, like, we can keep, <laughs> keep relationships at bay with all our stuff. Um, so I don't know. It's just a book. I was reading it, and my brain was, like, flooded with thoughts because it was it's such a, a provocative book. Um, so it's cool. It's always just wonderful to be able to talk to the, the author after reading a good book. Um, but, but I do want to keep with poems. Let's do another poem. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. This uh, page 44. This is called uh, The Poem You Will Not Live to Write. The poem you will not live to write. The poem you would have written. If only you'd had one more month, one more day, one more hour is a killer a no-holds-barred, balls-out masterpiece, the one where you put it all together, everything you learned, everything you suffered, all the bits of being human you spent your life gathering up. It's the poem you have been waiting for all your life. The poem you will not live to write, the next poem you would have written after the last poem you will write, which is, it must be said, a perfectly decent, unexceptionable, unexceptional poem, the sort of poem you would have read in some magazine or other had someone else been the author, or made it through the first half anyway, and then maybe turned to the theater reviews or the gossip column, or else just put the whole tiresome issue aside, is, let's just admit it, a knockout. There's no avoiding the fact. The poem you will not live to, to write is the one that would make the grocer's daughter come back to you. It's the poem you would wear like a pair of expensive stolen shoes to a wedding you weren't invited to. It's the one that waits for you in the dark, unseen in the underbrush, just outside the campfire zone of protected light, with nothing but an uninhibited, passionate kiss and your death on its mind. And that was the poem you will not live to write, again from Earthly Delights. Um, so I think we've done the, the difficult part of the interview, um, you know, because <laughs> now I just I do like to know, you know, about poets backgrounds and stuff. And for you, we've done 151 episodes. You're the first philosophy professor we've interviewed um, or had as a guest. Uh, so what is it? What is it that drew you to poetry and, and, and philosophy, too? Like, what is the difference? Why do you write in both completely? I mean, almost you couldn't get farther apart than philosophy and poetry as far as the writing process and, and what you're doing goes, I think, what you're engaging with in your brain. Is that part of it that they're so far apart? I mean, why are you drawn to both? I think there probably is something to that idea of them being far apart and that drawing me. But I also want to say, um, this is a popular perception about them being so different. And I always want to push back a little against it and say, well, you know, they have more in common than you might think. And I think that there's common elements that drew me. And so for instance, um, it, obviously you have to be logical when you're doing philosophy in a way that, that you can't really be when you're writing poetry. And in fact, too much logic kills poems. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I did have to learn, you know, to, to stop being logical and to trust 
my sense of image, uh, my sense of what the poet James Richardson called dream logic. Uh, and, and he impressed the, the importance of that early on me or many years ago. Um, and, and then also more than anything, I think the music, you have to trust the music. Sometimes the music of the poem is gonna tell you where it's going and you're gonna worry because it doesn't make sense. And then you have to say to yourself, well, I don't understand it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't make sense. I mean, I'm just the poet. Uh, you know, maybe the readers will understand it. Maybe the critics will understand it. And if nobody understands it, it still sounds good and it still feels meaningful. So nobody can give a paraphrase of it, whatever, right? Who cares? Poems aren't meant to be paraphrased. So that trust in the music is so important. And, and so all of this, I think, goes along with what you said that, you know, you have to suspend logic to some degree or not let it kill the poem. But then on the other hand, I wanna say that for instance, when you're writing philosophy, to write good philosophy, you have to be creative. And even to come up with good philosophical ideas, if they have any originality, you have to be creative. And I don't think that creativity is that different from the creativity you need as a poet. And I think that combined with that in, in both disciplines, in both practices, there is this close attention to language. Both philosophers and poets really scrutinize language and they really pay attention to it. And, and now again, the focus is a little different because the philosopher again is still thinking about logic and the logical implications. The poet is also doing that, but the poet is also, because they're sort of like a kid at heart, you know, so the poet is also saying, yeah, but how does that word sound? And how does that word feel? You know, and how does it look on the page? Like philosophers don't really care about that stuff, right? So sure, poets are really interested in the, sensuous and material aspects of the language in a way that philosophers generally aren't. Um, which is why you can generally translate philosophy, but not poetry. Although, you know, translating Wittgenstein, for instance, I don't know if that can really be done. So, yeah, but he's a very poetic writer, right? He's really a poet, not a philosopher, some people would say. Anyway, I think there's a lot of common ground that I have been drawn to. And at the same time, the fact that they're different means I'm not always stuck doing one thing. And that's a real boon for a writer because you can really get into a rut. It's one of the great dangers of writing. And for me, you know, whenever I get stuck with poetry or when the poetry just isn't coming, because I really do depend on the muse to show up and give me that stuff, right? When it's not coming, I can work on the philosophy essay or, or a literary essay or book review, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I work in a lot of different genres and, and that's really nice to be able to switch it up like that. It's a relief. Do, do you find that you're drawn to the same topics in, in sort of subject matter in the two in two fields? You know, yeah, are they two the, ways of tech, you know, interrogating the same object or are they separate completely? It, no, they're very, they, to an almost ridiculous degree, I end up writing about the same things in both. Um, I think, you know, I've, I've treated love and personal relationships and stuff more in philosophy than in poetry, but it's certainly they, they show up in poetry. I guess I've written about things like terrorism and philosophy that I've never written about in, in poetry. So there's not a complete correspondence, but I think the deeper questions that keep coming up for me, that keep coming up in both. Again, the, the relation of, of art to life, I keep trying to get to write something good and smart about that, both in poems and, and in essays. I, I just started an essay the other night I've been thinking about for a long time. And I realized I've already said some of this stuff in a poem. And I thought, you know, well, people are going to complain. And they've got the, ah, we know, what, what's the chance somebody's going to read the poem and the essay? Like nobody's going to even know. So I, I can get away with it, right? Mm -hmm. But no, there's a real, I, I'm sort of obsessed with a small number of questions. Mm -hmm. And I think that my poetry and my philosophy keep returning to those issues. Well, in a way, I mean, poetry and philosophy are both concerned with the same things, like the big almost impossible to answer questions about yeah. life and, and what is, you know, why are we here? And, you know, what is the meaning of this existence and what do we know? And, you know, what don't we know about ourselves, even though we think we know and all sorts of, you know, those kind of bigger questions are always what, what really is what draws us to poetry. And it, it does feel to me like two different ways of, you know, attacking something that's like the same kind of subject matter, which is why it's so interesting to me to see do, doing both at the same time. Um, yeah. how, how was it? Did you always write poetry? Was it something that you always did or did it come at it later? Um, or did the philosophy come first or did you just do both the whole, your whole life? Philosophy definitely came later. I didn't really even know what philosophy was. I mean, I, the, the philosophical thinking started really early because I was a kid and all kids are natural philosophers. But as far as writing philosophy goes, be, becoming aware of philosophy as a genre of its own and as a discipline didn't really happen until I was in uh, university. Because even in my high school, it was a small, pretty rural high school, so there were no philosophy courses or anything. Uh, I had a friend who was interested in Nietzsche, so I sort of knew a little bit about Nietzsche, and there were a couple things like that. But it was really in university that I, I went to university intending to major in English because I was going to be a writer. 
and, and it was there I got drawn into philosophy and started you know, writing philosophy in that sense, whereas I've been writing poetry for years, but, but very bad poetry. I mean, I've been, I wrote bad poetry for a long time, um, but that did come sooner. And, and that was again, partly, um, you know, it, it's always interesting the history of somebody sort of their encounters with particular texts and authors that, that are so much a matter of chance and, and they end up being so instrumental in shaping them, I think. You know, so it just happened that my father, when he was in university, had a, a course in poetry or something, and he never talked about it, but he still had a couple of textbooks. And so downstairs, there was this anthology of modern poets that had Yeats in it. Uh, and so I read Yeats and I read The Second Coming, which just blew me away. I thought like, oh, there's something going on here that like, it, it felt, you know, Yeats was very interested in mysticism and that came across. And I, at that age, I was also very interested in mysticism. I felt like there are deep truths of the universe that this guy is kind of getting across to me. Uh, and then uh, either that book or maybe the other one had uh, The Wasteland in it. And so I read T.S. Eliot, I read The Wasteland and again, felt like somebody out there was writing about something on, the, uh, on a much deeper level than the other stuff I was encountering, this sort of mostly informational stuff that, that I had come to think of as what most writing was. And then suddenly I get, you know, the wasteland and the second coming and, and Byzantium and so on. And I'm thinking like, whoa, language can do stuff I had no idea it could do. And so immediately many strong, absurd desires begin to, you know, sprout in me that I wanted to understand these texts, first of all. And I also wanted to write stuff like that. You know, like I wanted to enter this sort of, you know, elect a group, whatever it was. I wanted to be one of these people. Um, learn to do that, however one does that. And so that, you know, so Elliot led me to, to Ezra Pound and in our library, I sort of randomly picked out a, a collection of an anthology of Canadian poets and it had a guy named Christopher Dudney in it who nobody I think down here knows, but, but he's really wonderful. His early stuff is amazing. And then he led me to Michael Ondaatje. And so you just, and Gary Snyder was in an anthology I happened to pick off the shelf. And that really moved me because there was you know, again, I was, I was a kid, I was sort of a nascent environmentalist. I, I was worried about the, the world and nature and, and I felt the, the political pull of that. And so that kind of, probably Gary Snyder, in fact, was the one, his poem Front Lines was the one that made me realize that poetry could be political and that could be really powerful. Mm -hmm. So all those sort of, and this all happened probably when I was what, you know, between 10 and 15, I'm guessing. So, you know, I happened to come across these texts that in some way I was ready for, or I responded to or whatever, and they just pulled me in. And from then on, I was reading a lot of poetry and trying to write poetry. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah and, that, and I've just never stopped that. <laughs> Very cool. Um, let's hear another poem. You know, since I'm talking about Canadian artists, um, I'm gonna read this poem for Gord Downey. It's on page 12. Gord Downey was a guy who meant a lot to me and to a lot of Canadians. He was the lead singer for the band, The Tragically Hip, wonderful band. Um, got to see them in concert a couple of times. Amazing, amazing live show. He was a really, really interesting guy and he died very young of brain cancer. And uh, when he was diagnosed and uh, it was clear that it was terminal, there was you know, just basically no chance he was gonna recover. Whereas most people I think would have said, okay, you know, I'm gonna go to my cabin on Lake Ontario and I'm just gonna you know, be comfortable there for the rest of my days or whatever. Gord Downey of course said, get the band together, we're going on tour. And that's what he did. They did the last tour. It was, it was quite amazing. I did not get to see it live, which is one of my great regrets. But, um, but I, like I said, I got to see him a couple of times before. So this is called Poem for Gord Downey. It's one of the few elegies that I've published. You were always there singing from the back of the car as if you were drunk back there dreaming and singing while I drove aimlessly around the outskirts of everybody's hometown, learning where the lovers go after dark and practicing the names that had been rearranged, reassigned to the sacrosanct dark spaces that remained underneath the crooked branches of the trees, and you were reconnoitering the impenetrable waters of that vast silent sound, collectively known as the collective Canadian unconscious, like someone searching for a drowned diver or a slipped off wedding ring. A nation will watch me die, you sang from back there, and I believed it the way you believe something that somebody says in their sleep. Fireworks by the side of the road, northern lights and harbor lights perpetually enticing, perpetually retreating, holding themselves at a constant unbridgeable distance from my ungovernable eyes. 
I flailed my way to a first kiss as your face published itself on every TV screen and every bar. Last night I dreamed you were in my kitchen or else you are a sled dog on the snowy plain nuzzling the furry neck of Kurt Cobain, dancing to Schoenberg, drinking schooner in Lunenburg. And it was really you, wasn't it, who came paddling past? Really you whose psalms and sonics sang the stoic poles together? I think now that maybe we were not a nation until we watched you sing and die. Oh, Gord, I lift this last round to the sprawling sound of those gravid growlings you brought up from those dark waters and the verses you engraved on the vast white wall of unmusic that we face but cannot force ourselves to face. Listen now, that wail from the West's waste effaced margins. Listen now, these foreign shores, those fallen final invitations. Listen now, this ceaseless silence you have signed and left behind you. Oh, wow, and that was poem for Gordon Downey. When I read it, I didn't know the story of Gordon Downey, so that means a lot more knowing that. Yeah, yeah great poem. Um, again, this is from Earthly Delights by uh, Troy Jellymore's newest book. Um, let's see, so, so um, um, Judith Fay here asks, Troy, could you speak a bit about your process with the poem, the idea, the struggle, form, drafts? And she also suggests it would be great if you uh, would could pick one. Um, you read and talk about how it ended up that way on the page. So I don't know if you have two poems left, maybe. So do you want the second to last one? If you can think of something that you can like remember how it started and how it changed over time, that might be interesting. But what is your process like just in general? In general, um, she mentioned several of the stages, ideas, struggle, especially struggle. There's always, not always, I, I've got that small number of poems that sort of just came to me, you know, and they're already done. That's wonderful. That's like a gift when that happens, but so rare for me. Most of my poems have so much struggle and the, the big thing for me, and, and you've probably heard other poets say this, poets are saying this all the time, but it's so important. The, the, the key, you know, is to get out of the way and learn to listen and be receptive and, and let the poem tell you what it wants to be. Because it's so hard. I mean, there's so much ego involved. You know, going back to your earlier question, what's wrong with us? That's another thing that's really wrong with us. We have so much ego. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the philosopher Iris Murdoch, and philosopher and novelist, right? Iris Murdoch was always talking about this, that our ego just gets in the way and we can't see anything. We're blinded because all we can see is sort of its own distortions and this stuff that comes refracted through it. And we have to kill that ego or at least push it out of the way so that we can see things as they are, which is so difficult. And I think something like that is really true writing poetry that, Again, I can, I can set out to write a love poem or a political poem and think, oh, it's really important that I do that. Or, you know, I'm gonna write a sonnet today. Damn it, this poet is gonna be a sonnet. God damn it, it doesn't wanna be a sonnet. Stop resisting poem, right? Like that doesn't work. That's the wrong kind of struggle. You're trying to force something into a shape that it doesn't want to be. It's not really its shape. And you're gonna end up with a deformed, inauthentic poem. And so it's easy to say this in abstract terms and very difficult to say exactly how you do this, right? But certainly I think reading a lot of poetry and getting the music of it in your head is really important. And, and once you start to do that, and once you start to get a feel for your own music and recognize it, then as poems come to you, you, you do start to have a sense of, oh, you know, this one wants to do this. This one isn't a formal poem at all. It wants to be free verse and it wants to be really sort of long, but with really short lines. You know, that's what it's going to look like. And that's how it's going to sound when I read it. And, oh, it turns out it's about this thing that I didn't even know I had any interest in, but clearly that's what the poem is about. And I'm going to let the poem do what it wants. And so I'm going to find out about this thing, right? Whatever it is. It almost always for me, when it's good, when it's going well, feels like a matter of being led somewhere and not imposing anything on it. And, and then along with that, I think maybe it's important to say, and this is maybe a little more practical too, but really good practical advice, I think for any kind of writing, uh, long periods of time during which you're doing other things, especially. Oh, he cut out, hang on a second. Let me try to see if we can uh, get him reestablished. Physical things are really your best friend. like. Oh, hang on one second, Charlie. You cut out. Um, the connection yeah. got bad for a second. Um, so you're in the middle of, you know, just talking about the the 
writing process. Um, do you remember the last couple sentences? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had just, I think, I don't know exactly where I cut out. So, but I, I was introducing a, a second and more practical piece of advice, mm -hmm. which is um, long periods of time during which you're doing other things like physical. Things. Ah, yeah. That's right yeah. where you cut out. Mm -hmm. oh, good, good. Perfect. So, uh, and, and not just for poetry, but anything like I give my students this advice. It, none of them take it. Because all of my students are determined, as all students are these days, we're going to do every assignment the night before it's due, right? But I always tell them that's the worst possible way to write anything. Like, start writing it the day you get it, even if it's only a few words, but get them down on paper. Mm -hmm. And then go off and do other things, you know, go play baseball, take a shower, right? go dancing, whatever, anything to change up your mind, because that stuff's so good for the brain. And the magical thing is that even though you don't think you're thinking about it, some part of your brain is still working on that. Mm -hmm. And so when you sit down with it again, a couple of days later, it's like, oh, all this good stuff starts to come. Where's that coming from? But you need that time. Like if you don't give yourself those periods where you're doing other things and just the time to solve the problems and stuff, um, you know, the first, uh, or not the first, but the first uh, substantial poem I read, Marvelous Things Without Number, I wrote years ago and the ending was just wrong. And, and so I walked around with it knowing I couldn't publish it or do anything with it yet because I hated the ending so much. And years went by and I stopped thinking about it for a long time. And then one day I sat down and looked at it and I got to a certain point and I could just feel the poem wanting to go a different way. And I just went with that. And now it's got the ending it has, which I think really works, but it took years quite literally. And that's not the only poem that I have that that's true of. I think we often want to finish something, of course. And so we rush and you know we, we want to get it nailed down, but that right bit hasn't come yet. Something's still waiting to happen. So part of the art is of course knowing when it is done and when it's as good as it's gonna get. And, and that's very hard, of course, because you always feel like they could be better, right? So that's one of the tricks to it as well. And there's nothing to say about that other than it, it's a judgment that you, you have to develop the ability to make, but it's really important to be able to do that too. Well, that was great advice about, um, especially about, about starting a poem and then giving it space before you finish. That's something I need to do, especially for the, the prompt poems we have. Cause, uh, I, I mean, I probably other people too, just write it the night before the morning of, and, <laughs> um, you know, that doesn't, doesn't really work that way or it makes it a lot harder than if you uh, start it right away. So I'm going to try that. I'm going to write at least one line of the prompt poem the same night. And then maybe that'll, maybe that'll make it work better for me. <laughs> um, so we got time for two more poems. Maybe what do you want to read? Is there something you can like look at how it came to be? That's an interesting question. I think, uh, yeah, let, let me read Next Life, which is on page 42. Because okay. this is a poem, I'll say this before I read it, this is a poem that really started with the ending. I, I had the end, I had that image, and I even had, the, I think, the language of the end, and I didn't know how to get there. And so the writing of the poem was a matter of figuring out how to get to that ending. Next Life. For my next life, I'll need a volunteer from the audience. Something in a 36 long would be nice. Something in an endless line of sleek black cars with a coffee bar in back and exhaust that tickles the nostrils like sweet juniper trees in the first cool hour of evening. Someone who will stand erect and unashamed before the committee and not name names. Something in a self-propelled auto-tune disaster that would drive anyone's parents off the deep end. After so many years, You'd think we'd understand the complex second stage of the secret handshake, or know where to get a good sandwich in these parts, or at least know enough not to risk the lives of all 63 members of the submarine crew by diving to the bottom of the ocean in search of a bell the captain heard, or thought he heard in a dream when he was only seven years old. That's a great ending. That was Next Life. And so the ending came first on that poem. Yeah. And for a long time, again, I didn't know anything else about the poem. And it was a matter of figuring out what else happens in that poem that sets up that ending so that it hits home, hopefully with the force and the resonance that you want it to have. But that ending came to me sort of, you know, in, in one bit and it was pretty much done immediately. And so it, it's nice when that happens because, you know, you have a poem. It, it's, it's on the way. It's, it's like it's in the mail. You know, it's coming. It's just not there yet. And waiting for it can be hard, but it's better to have that seed than when you're waiting for one of those seeds to show up and you have nothing, of course. Yeah. Um, one of the things you talked about is truth. And um, 
Um, what do you think about about truth in poetry? Um, you know, do, do you try to tell things? Are you, are you allowed to lie in search of a bigger truth? You know, is there a difference between like t- you know short term facts and like long term truth? Um, how do you think of that? Or do you try to be truthful in all things? Is that part of being truthful? I don't worry too much in poetry as opposed to philosophy or nonfiction writing about truth as far as specific facts go. I'm happy to fudge things. Uh, if it's something that's significant, I, I usually will make a note so that nobody gets, I, I don't want anybody coming away believing something false on the basis of my poems. But I figure that for the most part, as with novels and, and fiction in general, that people know that the fact that something's in a poem doesn't mean it actually happened. And, and certainly the fact, I, I hope everyone is aware that the fact that something is, is described by a first person speaker or narrator in a poem doesn't mean that, oh, this, the author actually did this. That, that speaker might not be the author at all. And we shouldn't assume, you know. Now there are authors that really fuck with us that way and make us want to assume and so on, John Berryman, et cetera, you know, but, but I think that's very productive and fun and interesting as well. Um, but we should always be at least somewhat skeptical about that. And I think the idea you mentioned, the phrase, the, the larger truth, that's what's important. That there's a kind of a vision of life that I'm hoping I'm trying to get at or get across. And that's what needs to be true. I, I want this to be true to life in that broader sense. That is, I want all my work. I, I talked before about poets and philosophers both paying precise attention to language. And I think part of that is trying to, the, the, the part of the point of that is to describe the phenomena correctly and say, well, look, we talk about the world so much in, in such simplistic ways. And, and again, going back to conspiracy theories and all that, what are conspiracy theories? They're simplifications. We have this infantile craving for simplistic stories that make everything make sense and popular accounts of science that makes understandable even to us, even if we know nothing about physics or whatever. And we wanna feel like we understand, though of course we're not gonna do the work to actually understand it. And I think that poetry and philosophy and any responsible writing has to resist that and push back against it and say, look, things are complicated in the world. Uh, political events have complicated histories behind them. We have to know about those histories if we're going to understand them. People are complicated and we have to treat them as complicated beings or else we're just going to get them wrong and we're, we're going to dismiss them too quickly. You know, we're going to say if somebody, oh, they're just a terrible person. That's why they did that end of story, which is always a crazy simplification. Mm-hmm. So I think that broader truth for me is, is connected with complexity, resisting simplification, uh, to use one of my wife's favorite words, nuance. Um, you know, that it's so important to try to get at nuance and not the, the rough outlines, but really in, in a nuanced, detailed, precise way, what's happening, you know, what's mm-hmm. going on. And, and for me, one of the great values of poetry as, as a tool is that it describes or it enables us to describe human consciousness and experience in such a detailed, precise, nuanced way that it's just almost impossible to do otherwise. So mm-hmm. when you read a good poet, a lot of the time you end up thinking to yourself, Yes, that's what I was thinking, but I didn't know it until I read it here. You know, yes, that's what experience is like. Yes, that's what it feels like to do that. They got it right and they got it on the page. And now I understand it more deeply than I did before. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think truth is is just extraordinarily important. Yeah, I love the way you put that, because I've always felt and you're talking about like the, you know, the meaning of art or what art is. I always thought the endeavor of art is to 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 find increasing. It's like the the long term human endeavor of finding making sense out of the complexity of of our own experience, you know, and, and it's infinitely complex. We can't wrap our minds around it, but then we make art that gets a little bit more understanding and we accumulate that knowledge over the years. So that's, it, it, you know, complexity is like really at the heart of it, I think, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Of course, it's, it's okay for art to be entertaining too, but I, I think that when, when it's truthful, it is more entertaining. I think they go together. So. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we have time for one last poem. What do you want to finish up with? You know, I haven't read, um, I mean, I, I mentioned there's a lot of poems about movies in here and, and I've got this sequence called screenshots and I thought I'd read one of those. Uh, the idea of the screenshots poems, of course, is that each one is dedicated to a particular film and the connections to the films are, are quite various and, and in some cases pretty distant. But um, in, this is, uh, I'm gonna read the one called Inside Lewin Davis, it's on page 95. So it's about or connected to the Coen Brothers film from I think 2013 starring Oscar Isaac, Inside Lewin Davis, about a folk musician. Because it is not the successful quest that fascinates, dragons defeated, villains vanquished, cover-ups uncovered, the planet's perfect balance restored, 
or moralized tales of straining against the odds in the faith that genuine talent and goodness of heart will eventually win out. No, not today. But the unfinished task, the unfairly overlooked, the arrow gone astray, the underdog who stays under forever. Because this time around, our sympathies lie not with Bob Dylan, Nobel laureate, but rather with the scruffy guy who warmed up the crowd for him and then left, and now is getting beat up in the alleyway out back, whose snow trudging odyssey from New York to the gates of Horn and back again is the dark and unexperienced B-side of A Star is Born, or maybe The Wizard of Oz, the alternate ending the studio sat on, a story to be repeated, never new, never old, and rarely acknowledged. Not the driver that takes the Akron exit, but the one who is too afraid to, who almost does and then doesn't, who sticks to the path and just drives on into the dark. Not Ulysses, but some unnamed alley cat abandoned somewhere outside of Chicago. Not Lewin's voice, as much as it moves us, no, but the unheard harmony part sung by the singer who made his exit before the first light flickered up to the screen, before the first note was sounded, who, for silent reasons of his own, jumped from the wrong bridge to wander the immaterial streets and play the old songs and haunt the footnotes of the history of some unsuspected invisible republic, or alternatively, the unwritten, unread, heretofore unfilmed alternative history of this one. And then with screenshots inside Llewellyn Davis. Um, again, the last poem we read from uh, Earthly Delights, the newest book by Troy Jollymore. Thanks, Troy. It's been a delight talking to you. I knew it would be, um, but just a lot of uh, a lot of learning and a lot of pleasure. And I just love getting to have the uh, the poet here to talk about the books. Uh, thanks so much. It's a lot of fun. Thank you for asking me. I really yeah. appreciate and it. And is Heather back yet from uh, her trip? Um, Heather is back. Yes, yeah, she's oh, great. Uh, yeah. So, so Heather yeah. Heather um, uh, Altfelt, Troy's partner, is uh, going to be the guest the first week in August, I believe. And uh, she just got she was on a uh, in Egypt, which can be fascinating to talk about. Um, but looking forward to that episode too. Um, but tell her we said hi, and uh, we'll see her soon. Thank, thanks, Troy. Absolutely, thank you. Take care. It was Troy Jollymore, and of course his uh, book was Earthly Delights. Once again, um, you can find Troy's website at uh, troyjollymore dot com. That's just Troy T R O Y J O L L I M. O-R-E.com, Troy Jellimore uh, Earthly Delights, Tom Thompson and Purgatory. I just love that book. One of my early favorites. Um, good stuff all around. So uh, we are going to take a quick break, and we're going to go to the open lines. Now, let me tell you how it works, and I have to log into my open mic at rattle.com account, too. But, uh, but how it works is this. Email your poem right now to uh, open mic. That's open M-I-C at rattle.com. Whatever you'd like to share can be the prompt poem from last week, which was to write a confessional canzone, uh, a very, very challenging uh, prompt for last week. Uh, see if anybody pulled it off. And uh, you can write, you can send news poems about current events. You can send poems that were published recently and would like to share. Uh, include a link if it was published online. We'll show that on screen as well so people can learn about other literary magazines. All of it very good. Whatever you'd like to share, email it, though, to open mic. That's open, M-I-C, at rattle.com. And I'm grabbing the Zoom link right now. Um, and we will paste that in to Facebook. Or, and we will paste that into YouTube. So here's the Zoom link. Zoom link's deployed. They will be pinned to the top. It is right here. Pinned to the top. And uh, join us if you'd like to share a poem. If you would not like to share a poem, though, and just want to keep watching, do not go anywhere. The uh, Zoom meeting is only for people who would like to share poems. Uh, you can pop on, share a poem, come back and watch on YouTube so you can read along as we go. Um, yeah. So... Uh, yeah, so come on over. Here's on a, on a Facebook, too. Sorry, I'm doing too many things at once right now. Okay, so I'm going to take a quick break, and everybody trickles in, and we start to share some poems, and I will be right back.
And we're back. Thanks for your patience. Um, uh, I didn't mention, too, that if you are on the Zoom, I should say this all the time. If you're on the Zoom, please uh, only watch through the Zoom or mute the YouTube. You can't have both streams because there's a delay going on. So you can't be on Zoom and watch it on YouTube or Facebook or whatever at the same time. Um, make sure you have, you're just watching through Zoom if you're going to share poems on Zoom. If you're just going to watch and listen and enjoy poems, uh, YouTube or Facebook or Twitter is the place to stay. So just keep watching there. That's the best experience. Um, but let's go first to, um, let's go to Mark, Mike Bales. Uh, I think we had trouble with Mike last time. Let's see if it, uh, if the audio connects well and stuff. It's an old laptop. I hope it works. Excellent. Yeah, we're looking good. Uh, Thanks, Mike. Good to see you. Um, yeah, glad to be back. I can occasionally do Mondays, but some Mondays I might leave for karaoke and not do it. <laughs> um, I did your Canzoni thing. I don't know how confessional it is, but I think there, there's a night recently in the last week where it was raining and stormy, uh-huh. which is kind of interesting, the power of it. Then it goes to steady rain, which is interesting. But one of the most amazing silences that is after it all ends, how quiet is outside. And to me, that's a big sense of nothingness. This has to do with that. It's, I just, I emailed it to you a little while ago. It's a poem near midnight, a yeah. Kazoni. Yeah, I have it right here. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Near midnight, a Kazoni. A fall of rain brings a quiet night, a tri- time of dreaming and delight. As time presses toward midnight, Soft moments of realizations as I sit alone at night, as images settle into dreams, this darkness of night. The yard and shadows lies, a soliloquy of night, when I live one in many lives, memories of my father passing at night, the spell of nothingness cast, when a sense of sadness gives way to a sense of delight. In moments of silence, I listen to inner voices, when my life story is recited to the promise of light as I seek my rest. In back of the house, the glow of a street light, when the moon and stars dance above the sky as the world around me sleeps. My heart and soul seek shelter of the night while leaves and oaks sing in a gentle wind. The world I know lives and dies. A fall of rain brings a quiet night. Excellent. Yeah, great use of those repetitions. Good stuff, Mike. Always a pleasure. Okay, thanks. Yep, bye. Yep, bye. It was Mike Bales with a Near Midnight, a Canzone. Let's go to uh, Sean Hu Lee. Hey, Hello. Sean Hu. Yeah, how are you doing? Pretty good. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. It's great to see you. Uh, so what do you have? You have a canzone too. Yes, nine. I sent to you. Yeah, I have it right here. Um, is there anything you want to say about it before you uh, start? Yes. Should I start it? Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, it's, it was very difficult to the the form. Yeah, it's a tough form. And I didn't say that I uh, I didn't manage to write mine. I, I started it, which, um, you know, so now as we learn from Troy, it's percolating in the back of my brain. I have the first stanza, or the first half stanza. Know what I'm going to write about, um, but it was too busy and too, I, I didn't do myself any favors picking a tough form this week because it's a very busy week for me. Um, but maybe we'll finish it off later. But uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm glad to see a bunch of people actually got got it done. It's a tough one. But I didn't do it in confessional way. I didn't know that. So I oh, didn't... that's fine. That's fine. <clears throat> so, nine canzone. Who are these ugly, nine ugly people? Do they think they are the gods? It's none of your business. Get out of my business. When did I give them this power? They are just nine regular people with all possible flaws like all other people. And now they decided to dictate my life, decide what I should do with my life. They became the justice chosen by wrong people. This is not about the pro-life or pro-choice. I don't want to live by someone else's uh, choices. Gee, they don't look like the God. They are just nine flawed people. Do they really believe they are the gods? Well, I don't believe in God. 
for wrong reasons, they became justice. They are just nine senseless people selected by even mm. more senseless people. And now they make the laws about my body. What kind of laws? Do they really believe they are the gods? This is not about the poor choice or pro-life. No one can decide what I should do with my life. It's my body. It's my life. It's none of your business. Whether I live a happy life or a miserable life, it's none of your business. You cannot dictate my life. I decide what I do with my life. Ah, excellent. And great choice of the word to be repeated there. Yeah, great poem. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. It was Sean Huli with Nine Canzone. Um, you can find more at seanhuli.com. So uh, thanks for sharing the link too, Sean Huli. Uh, let's go to uh, Richard Westheimer next. Hey, Dick. How are you doing? Hey, Tim. I am doing well. And I wrestled with that. that <laughs> form. I was like having a hydra wrapping itself around, you know, like getting halfway through and thinking I might have chosen the wrong words. And mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it really was. I, I don't know. Um, it, it was tough. And, and actually, we have only four people uh, on the call right now. So it's a short open lines. I think um, it, it was a bear of a, uh, a poem to wrestle. But uh, let's see what you did on a dream day drawn from my darkest desires. Yeah, and I, that was just sort of a ploy to put all of my words in the title. <laughs> oh, good idea. So let's let, let's let's give this a shot. Okay. On a dream day, when drawn from my darkest desires, I've come to know poison ivy in all its guises, from the dark green climbing kind to the menacing jade jewel leaves etched with dark uh, malefic veins to the warded kind with their angry skin tags drawn on with some of the, uh, the sort of welting I might expect if I rubbed my flesh with those dark oils. My impulses tottering between comfort and a sirened desire to reach out and gather the evil folioles, a deed I wouldn't dream except when lulled into a drowsed humor by the heat of the day. This is like the fire of other seductions and fearsome itches, like being drawn to the alluring flash of skin of some stranger's bare shoulders, the desire when walking near the edge of a cliff to take that one step, being drawn into the abyss, or when pouting about some mild affront I've had that dark, dark urge to grit my teeth, squeeze the neck of an innocent. And do you, do you dream that that kid from grade school who pinched you till you bled would today hear he had cancer or better yet be one of those victims of the so, so darkest of our kind, the rooftop shooter, the vested bomber who dreams some glorious end? I've been all these terrible men. But most days, a good dad, a tender lover, a keeper of oaths, and one who draws folks back from the poison vines, who walks the woods and leaves by day, salts the inflamed leaves, clears the trails, making way for careless daydreamers to make their ways through the trees and grassy places, escape their desires for screens and plastic things for the few hours they may spend this day away from the news, from their work, from whatever in their world is hard and dark. Which brings up the question, are we who draw back from the urgent lusts that devil our days, irredeemable or the most redeemed, or neither dark nor light but human? And about those never having such desires, are they some angel creature or are they a delusive dream? Oh, excellent. Thanks for sharing that, Dave. And that, that is a tough poem to get through, but you uh, you did a great job of it. It's a, it's a tough form. Um, and I definitely relate to some of that, too. I was just looking up recently uh, the kid who punched me in the stomach on uh, in my, yeah. scout, <laughs> my scout troop or whatever, right before I had to walk up the stairs to see everybody. So I was like, oh, you know, in great pain. Uh -oh. And I thought, I'm going to get back at him. 
I looked him up and he is like this big, tough biker. I'm never going to get back at him. So. Well, or, or <laughs> probably the kid who pinched me is a sweetheart who yeah, is, could, you know. Yeah, that's the other, the other option. Good. Yeah. That's great. Do we have time for another? Or are you? Uh, um, yeah, I think that... so. I mean, people are coming in a little bit, a few people, but we have time. Yeah. So, what do you want to share? Um, the PR poem. Yeah, sure. Let me just pull it up to explain what it's about. It's while I do that. So, if you don't want to do two, that's no, simple. we're good. I think because we have uh, there's five people after you, so it's not that many. So, I was one of the one of the slush pile of Independence Day shootings. You know, mm. it was uh, um, it was hard hard to look away. Uh, so I understand why you got why you got that, and I also understand after getting five hundred of them why you chose a, a hike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot in the space of surrounding it, you know. It's uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that that was terrific. Um, as was the interview today. It was just it was great to hear the philosophy and and poetry woven woven yeah. together. Yeah, fun fun discussion with Troy. Um, I have it up, so go ahead whenever you're ready. Considering the various things do uh, folks detonate on Independence Day, they play a strange symphony next door, an anthem for a nation composed of blasts and booms. By the end of June, the locals' customary crack of rifle shots fuses with firework salutes. It's hard for me, unschooled in the syllabus of black powder, to distinguish one from the other. The snap ratchet of cherry bomb bursts and lady finger strings from the neighbor guy's bump stocked ARs. This morning of the fourth, in between the detonation frenzies next door, I trellis tomatoes. The tying up of vines exist in a sonic world of mourning doves, hoo hoo coos, and to tat, tat of a nearby woodpecker. This is the Neverland time, the moments when gunpowder ceases to exist but a heartbeat later, blasts tatter the air, make me jump like a just lit ladyfinger. Startled too, the critters cease their breeding songs and rooting for food. Then almost as suddenly, the fabric of local space mends. I breathe deep and return amnesiac to the small world, pruning plants and listening to living things. Two, by the time we get to the cookout at Karen and Stew's, the news, another shooting, this time a parade of innocence, is old news. I confessed to my wife that I'd seen that bloody tableau unfold in a daydream. Fireworks confused with rifle fire, a crowd scattering like ants kicked from a hill. She shushes me as we gather with our old friends by the pool, watch the little ones and their dads splash in the too blue water. As last light nears, the final beer cans are tossed in the green bin. The few of us friend, the few of us left at our friends sit back and await the show. Soon the sky ignites, galaxies of rubidium and chlorides like the sky to the strains of Sousa and Francis Scott Key. I see, circling around one of the sky rockets, cascading stars, a planet. In that parallel world, the tying of tomatoes is not interrupted by blasts and all parades of innocence end with cookouts and two blue pools. Yeah, another great poem. Thanks for sharing. Always a pleasure, Dick. Uh, that was another good one, considering the various things folks detonate on Independence Day. Yeah, good yeah. stuff. Thanks, Tim. Bye-bye. Bye. Um, let's go. I think I'm trying to go in the order of people here. Let's go to Mark Grinier next. Okay, uh, uh, this is supposedly a response to the Kenzani prompt, uh, not confessional, I don't think, although it does recall some of my ex uh, recently, you know, a couple of years ago experience where we had a fire just near our house. Oh, yeah. And I was I was thinking about the, the fire up in your area, and so that's where it, where it comes from. Where is it that you live, Mark? I don't remember. In Corona. I live on the edge of the Cleveland National Forest. Oh, okay. Corona. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A bunch yeah. of fires up there in that forest. It's like an annual, yeah. even more frequent than we do, maybe. Yeah, it has. They they come by too too frequently. Yeah, I think it's because you have more people in that. You know, we have, at least we have fewer people around to start, start them. <laughs> Uh, that one was the, the, the holy fire. It was started by some nutcase on the other side of the mountains in mm -hmm. Orange County who, I don't know what he was trying to do, but it burned for a week and it was very scary. Anyway, uh, I was 
that's what I was thinking about. It's really in Reem Royal. It's it's uh, so which is a derivation of the Canzoni form, was supposedly from the Italian Renaissance. Canzoni and fire season for Southern California. Fronds on palm trees fail, fail in the drought, fall away. Dusty seasons bring the Santa Ana's on. Summers come to stay, but children cannot play outside for fear of sunstrokes bludgeon, beating them into the ground, sending them on lost into the dreary playground of the grave, the dark dancing ground of those we cannot save. Desert winds are, have come, are raging once again. Memories of spring rain, evanescent hopes recalled as in fear as summer fires rise again, climbing as they have done before these dry slopes, bringing to us gray choking smoke, the end of hopes for better days when our children play in peace. Again, amid the trees, the lawn's green release. The growth of what is dying in pain today, our faith that new times will bring good fortune on, depends upon the promise of more new rain, the return of bright life blooming up the slopes where young children can play, maturing in peace, respecting Gaia's grace, our small place amid these mountains in the sun where shadowed songs rave. Yeah, excellent ending to the Canzone in fire season for Southern California. Thanks for sharing that, Mark. You're welcome. Okay, uh, let's go to Brent Stoffer next. Hey, Brent, how are you doing today? Yeah. Good. Uh, great show. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I really enjoyed the uh, the the, uh, the dovetailing philosophy and uh, poetry thing. It's uh, it was really good. And uh, I wanted to I wanted to ask him if, if anybody has ever done a uh, 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 contemporary translation of uh, Lucretius. You know, he did that that uh, the nature of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, lo it's been translated lots of times, but never in its lyric form. It was uh, evidently it was written as a poem. And I've never seen it presented. Oh, in you English. know what? I'm I trying to remember if it was A.M. Jester or if it was Art Beck. But one, someone we've published um, has a has a book of. It just came out like a year or two ago, two years ago maybe. Oh, cool. cool. Um, I can't remember which one it was though. But I, remember, I mean, they're they're. I remember reading them though. And they're uh, they're great. I mean, they're just so modern. You know, that's the thing. It reminded me of oh, what cool. it, what A.E. Stallings was talking about. How like it, you know, you see people are people still. You know, two thousand years later or yeah. however long ago that was. I mean, you know, there's a lot of like sex and humor and uh, you know irreverent yeah. stuff in there. It's not a uh, you know people yeah, it's were people like, back then. Uh, Canterbury Tales or something. Yeah, who was it though? I can't remember. But anyway, yeah, very cool. I know, I'll have to check that out. I have to Google it. Maybe yeah. I'll find it. Just if I just look it up. But, um, okay, so the form. Well, thanks, Tim. You did none of us any favor. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, actually, um, uh, it actually turned out to be um, a lot more fun than, than I thought it would be. <laughs> um, but um, I waited until the last minute, of course. And so I did a, uh, I did a, a it's in the title. It's trunc a truncated canzoni, where it's one uh, stanza, and then what's called an envoy, ah, mm -hmm. which is like a, a half stanza that is supposed to come at the end of several stanzas. Um, but it kind of works with uh, what happens in the poem for it to be truncated. Um, but I might come back and 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 uh, uh, add more stances to it uh, we'll have to see what i'll let it percolate as yeah, troy yeah, yeah definitely a lot of percolating going on and, tonight. <laughs> yeah <laughs> see okay. what happens yeah go ahead okay truncated hand zone the long lingering twilight lazily laced the bamboo stalks and filled our heads with light the two of us talked so lightly hushed in that cleared circle then humming with evening light Heaviness lifted. We felt light. Our words faded slowly in the air. It seemed we were floating in the air. You leaned toward me, slightly. You know how I am, you said. I take what I want, you said. Are you talking to me? 
I said to myself, not disturbing the air with sounds that might break the circle enchanting us. The future, though, stalked that delicate forest with the next day's light. Fairy tales tend to die in the daylight. Oh, that was great. The sounds come through so well in that, in the, the, you know, the form. That's what was so great about um, Alexis Sears, you know, is, is the way that the sounds kept pulling yeah. you back, you know, and the, and the repetitions too, and then some being slightly off. I think it's a cool form. I like it. I'm looking forward to actually writing the rest of mine instead of just three three lines, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe, maybe next week. <laughs> oh, I'd uh, love to see it, man. Yeah, thanks, Brent. Okay, Take care. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye. That was Brent Stauffer with a truncated canzone. Let's go to Jennifer Elise Wang. Hey, Tim. Hey, Jennifer. How are you doing this evening? I'm good. I got very confused about the canzone, so I'm, I'm enjoying hearing everybody. Uh, yeah, that was the thing about it. So I never heard of it before. And honestly, when I made the prompt, um, I have to confess, I didn't actually read the poem first. I was just like, I looked at the table of contents because I was trying to think, you know, she writes formal poems. And I was like, oh, that's one I never heard of. We'll make that the prompt. I put it in the uh, PDF and then I read it and I was like, ooh, that's tricky. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, my, my search um, brought me different forms, but it was kind of interesting learning well, that. That's the, the thing history. about it is that no matter where you looked up the definition of it, it there were to- lots lots of different definitions. So some people had it in that form that was kind of like the the um, the pan not the pantoum the uh, sestina, and mm-hmm. some people not, and so it, it was all over the place really. Yeah, so I don't have that, but uh, I have a. It's actually an older poet's respond, but I still think it's kind of relevant. And incidentally, today I even just got news that my friend had to end his drag show because of all the anti-LGBT legislation. And it's not even like directly related to the law. Uh, he got hit by insurance fees because oh, now drag wow. is turned into an adult industry so oh. uh yeah so my poem is very relevant even i wrote it a month ago uh, in what law is this in what state is it just one state that that's happening um, or? it's in texas the, mm-hmm. the the blatant attempt to ban drag shows for uh kids it, it was just like a proposed law in texas but i know like there's there's a lot of things slipping in like you know insurance fees or categorizing mm-hmm. it as adult entertainment and like mm-hmm. making it basically harder to produce shows Mm -hmm. yeah and i actually wrote this uh right after because i heard about that law the day after i came home from doing drag story time and so that's what like this poem is actually about is like my own experiences okay well go ahead i have it up for everybody all right i'll drag be the law when i was reading to children in another city with my spiked up hair and drawn on beard a group of fascists invaded my neighborhood They didn't make it in, but now the same lawmakers who invaded our bodies are trying to halt our joy and pride because they don't like rhinestones and wigs on men and trans women and cis women and non-binary folk. Anyone can be a drag queen after all. Those politicians probably don't like fake facial hair on femmes either. They would rather have kids stare down the barrel of an AR-15 than into thickly lined eyes framed by false lashes. They would rather have kids put a hand on a Glock than a hand than hand a dollar to a glittery glove that was voguing and tutty. They would rather have kids in a shroud than with boas around their necks. For two weeks, the nation cried over innocent lives taken in a senseless act of violence. But do the citizens realize the number of youth who have already died senselessly because they think the world will never love them? Because your parents can say they love you but they'll keep you from cutting your hair, even when you're over 30, and create a personal don't ask, don't tell policy for your partner of five years and counting. Because your roommates will celebrate your coming out, but only with the caveat that you never make a move on them. Because you can ignore the names bullies call you, but you can't ignore the name your family and friends insist is yours, but feels as much as a prison as your own body. Because doctors would rather have you live body horror than acknowledge that at eight years old, you know who you are. The drag of cis heteronormativity is the most exhausting, joyless performance a person can give. So if we are committing a crime, when I share my love of skateboarding at story time, while my sibling struts in a pink bustle and mustache, and my brother shakes his hips like Elvis, while one sister does a jump split to Britney, and the other pretends to sing like Whitney, yet children who are part of this giant rainbow alphabet soup can finally have a place to feel free and loved, then yes, we plead guilty. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Jen. And and great, uh, great use of the drag, um, you know, double entendre 
And uh, good dodging the cat, too, there to read still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Right, Thanks. Thank Always you. a pleasure, Jen. This is Jennifer Lee Swang with Drag versus the Law. Um, let's go to uh, Jared Lacey next. Uh, Jared hasn't been here in a long time. I think it's been two years since we've seen Jared. Hi, everybody. Hey, Jared. Really? How you doing? I'm doing great. And yes, it has been a while. I, I miss you guys. I miss uh, uh, listening to all these fantastic poets that come through here. Uh, I've been very busy working, uh, trying to save money and just trying to get back into the groove of life. You uh-huh. know? Yeah. That's, yeah, well, that's, it's that's, great. That's, great that's great to have you back. And, and you are, where are you? You're in Texas or somewhere like that? Uh, no, I am the I am in South Alabama, as a matter of fact. Uh, okay, yeah, very cool. Yes, um, I wanted to read my poem that I submitted to uh, Purpose Respond. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, uh, what uh, prompted me to uh, write this poem was a, a favorite YouTuber of mine. Uh, she was talking about the story uh, that came out of Oregon recently about the uh, Mormon cricket. Now, this is a cricket that has absolutely no qualms about uh, uh, showing its appetite, so to speak. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, been around since the uh, it's, its early records has been, has been, a, been around since the early 1800s. Uh, it is ravenous. And that's a word I use in, one, in the poem, uh, to say the least. And it's very hard and very difficult to uh, not think of this, uh, this cricket, which is actually a Katie did as uh, as a. <laughs> an antagonist. Mm-hmm. Um, the let's see. The uh, article had one word in it that really helped me write my poem, and it was the word biblical. So I kind of played with that a little bit, you know, and blended it in with giving a voice to this uh, cricket. Yeah, very cool. That we got to see. Uh, yeah, we got to see it on screen a little bit. I picked up, pull up the article. Yeah, those are interesting. Uh, interesting creatures there. Uh, go ahead with the poem, little yep. exoskeletons. I have that up now too. Sure. All right, little exoskeletons. There is no chill or breeze from relief anywhere. Family, it is time to showcase for these states our gluttony. Look how we're built. We're soldiers for famine. We're sun-loving sympathizers situated for someone else's supper. Our names are crunchy leeches, ravenous and unstoppable. We start on mountain high and descend on crops. I think we multiply with the stretch of the sky and build the sum more than the cosmos' size. We swallow everything grown from seed, and like mice, we'll even turn on family. Stupid, stupid, stupid humans, who crush our first waves, but only grease the streets with our guts like chicken fat, for a new number of hours, long and uncultured, to mulch on this opportunity. Do we know if we make the population scream, and that our namesake Mormon is or is an irony. No one outside of us could take our dictation for an answer. The 1800s are the true start of our records and our infamy exceeds all the raindrops Earth has seen. We are protein fiends. Come along grasshopper kin, dig in. Forget little Jimmy and his hardworking daddy and all the money to buy the killing spray that could steal more than our health. We are legion more alive. We eat their food to death. That was great. And that was yeah, yeah. Thank great, you. Great turn at the end. Of the little exoskeletons. Very cool yes. poem. Yeah, thanks so much. It's great to see you, Jared. Good, glad you could join again. Hey, guys, we're glad to see, show my face at long last. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Hope to see you again soon. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Yeah, Bye. Jared Lacey with uh, little exoskeletons. Uh, let's go to Angela Gartner next. Hi, Tim. Hey, Angela. How are you doing this evening? Good, real good. Yeah, I I did send you a poem. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know if you saw it. The Birdie Gathering. The Birdie Gathering. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about this. Well, it was a poet to respond like a while ago, but I think I'm obsessed with like just what people post on social media. Mm-hmm. So it's just um, it's it's always about Twitter. I just. I know social media is useful. I use Twitter. I use like all the social media platforms. That's part of my job, but I just can't believe like how people go in their camps and what they post. I just, and it's, it's kind of, I was watching out the window of these birds and I was thinking like how much they are like, you know, 
like places like Twitter and Facebook and, and mm-hmm. the posting, like, you know, the comment section, it's really not because you're not posting on it. You're commenting on all these different things. And it's kind of like how it kind of, I felt like how it's kind of how people comment on everything. So mm-hmm. it just blows my mind what people actually say <laughs> in that it's attached to their name. So, yeah, I know it's, uh, it's incredible what people will say about other people. It's just so dehumanizing is what the, the platform is. Uh, but aptly named, apparently, with a, as Twitter, <laughs> with the birdie yeah. gathering. Um, yeah, go ahead. I got it up for everybody. The birdie gathering. A blue bird watches the flock who are pecking at the ground. Some squabble over slimy worms. A used breakfast sandwich wrapper. The wind carried out of a garbage can. Their constant chirping echoes as the dew glistens in the morning. They are waiting for him to know where to go, north, south, a direction. They are quietly griping together in solidarity with their complaints of days and weeks flight plan and shortage of crunchy bugs. Some flew to the top of the garage to be first when he gives a signal. Others hopped across the street to the neighbor's yard to feed, but their heads were rigid to hear and see the group in the sun's glare bending down and spreading their wings. But the bluebird had yet to decide a pattern. Yeah, good stuff. The birdie gathering. Thanks so much for sharing that, Angela. Thank you. Have a good night. Yep, you too. <laughs> Thanks. It was Angela Gartner with the birdie gathering. Uh, let's go to T.R. Paulson. Is it up next, it looks like? Hey, T.R. Hey. hey. Yeah, how's it going tonight? Good. Happy vacation Monday. Oh, to me. very nice. Yeah. How, how long is your vacation? You just is it a staycation. Or you're doing something fun. It is a staycation. <laughs> well, that's my it's kind. It's my but, uh, me time. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Very nice. I, a lot of poetry, I, I assume. But I assume that I'm probably going to get called in Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, <laughs> and it will be. Ten- I will have to decide: Do I want to get paid overtime all day long, or do I want my day off? <laughs> yeah. And that will be the dilemma. So that when when you said there were only four people on, I said, well, I'll jump on and read my Prime Day poem from, um, what was it, Rattle 68? Uh-huh. Yeah, Because yeah, it's Prime that. Week and I hate Amazon and I want everybody <laughs> in the world to read this poem. Uh-huh. And, um, I mean, it's my goal. I would love, like if I accomplished nothing else in life, I would love to take Amazon down with a poem. So you, you know, you work for UPS, just so people don't, no, or for people who don't know. So, do you deliver Amazon packages? We, because they well, changed to long, like long. Yes, I mean the, the short answer is yes, but mm-hmm. the long, the slightly longer answer is that, like ten years ago, we got a variety. Like my truck would be full of a variety of things, like Macy's, mm-hmm. Sears, which you never see anymore, Zappos, which has been bought and absorbed into Amazon, and there would be these varieties of companies. But now, and then it went. During the pandemic, Amazon just completely took advantage of the fact that, you know, the online shipping and ever and just completely um, used that to make money. And then with all the money they made, they used it to hire their own drivers. Is that what happened? And they okay. pay their own drivers yeah, a lot see less that. than we make. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's part of their quest to monopolize the whole world, just like. Are we back? I think we're back. Let's see. I think we're back. Okay. So something happened with uh my computer. It might um <laughs> it might have uh is this working now? Okay, I think it is working now. Okay, so we're back. Yeah, I don't know what happened. My uh my stream shut off my my uh OBS, which is the, the thing I use, um disconnected from the server. But anyway, I think we're back. They're back. Okay. So <laughs> I don't know how much you missed, but but we were talking about Amazon. Um, let's just read the Amazon poem. And I'm glad everybody stuck around. Thanks for sticking around. Um, but go ahead. How I survive without a Prime membership. All right. And you got it on the, or you got it pulled up. So yeah, except they have to restart every. Uh... There we go. Now it's up. How I survive without a Prime membership. Let's say I need a thingamajig that flips and slips and grips and nips, a tool perhaps or just a treasure. Those trips to stores now obsolete, I simply Google a key phrase of action or appearance sought. Amazon appears atop the whirlpool of websites listed, of course. 
Coherence constant in their quest to draw me, lure me, and my credit card. Perseverance pays, and I discover that a simple tour with clicks or swipes pays dividends. The thingamajig has a name. Obscure, perhaps, but now I know it. I look up trends, using the real name for this thing I covet, and go to reviews to see who recommends brand A over brand B and why they love it. Now, with confidence, I search what's more and fully done with Amazon, sick of it. I leave it like last year's textbook, stored for future reference. A click or two, I find an exciting new company in which to pour my hard earned dollars. I may be resigned to pay some extra pennies for shipping or wait a week or two, but I don't mind. And I don't have to be a member, committed to a CEO who makes more per minute than I take home all year. Life seems rigged, but I'm happy. I order my thingamajig. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And great rhymes in that poem, too. That was a How I Survive Without an Amazon, Without a Prime Membership. Um, that was funny that as we were uh, criticizing Amazon and calling it a, um, you know, ramjack takeover of the world, uh, that cut out. I don't know. Maybe somebody. I would not put it past yeah. me, seriously. <laughs> Like, I don't know. It would have to be. I, I'm sure they're not watching the Rattlecast, but uh, <laughs> that it was strange. Thanks for sharing that, TR. Always a pleasure. Yeah. Have a good week. Yep. You too. Bye. And have a good vacation. Thanks. Uh, this is TR Paulson. Let's go to Kimberly. Hey. Hey, Kimberly McNeil. That's it. Kimberly McNeil. Yeah. Great to see you. Thanks for joining in. Yeah, did you get the poem? I did, but I'm not sure I can open. Let's see if it'll open for me because it's a pages. Um, I know, man. I have a Mac. Yeah, I can't open it. So we'll just have to listen. Okay. Unless you want to try to paste, unless you want to try to paste it in, I can go to Bev first and then you can, do you want to try to email it to me that way? I'll try to convert it to Word and send it to you You again. You can just paste it into the body of the email. Okay. I copied the poem and well, paste it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Give me. Give me. Okay. A we'll go. To, we'll go to Bev first. Okay. 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 Let's go to Bev. Hey, Bev. How are you Hi. doing? Hi. Great. That was a wonderful poet today. I enjoyed his, his talk about uh, political poems because I try to write those, but uh, it looks like if we if we come up with the our solution, then we then we actually are not um, doing what we should be doing in the poem. <laughs> yeah, that kind of is. I mean, it's just, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, a lot of poems feel like they're great op-eds, you know, like good yeah. you know, statements. And, and, and yeah. there's a value in that. But, um, but there, there's more that poetry should be doing, like angling in on something, I think. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Well, I think I'm going to read one of the bad ones, but um... <laughs> well, that's okay. I mean, there's a place for uh, for outrage too. So uh, let's hear Rogers outrage outage or outrage. Yeah. Oh, and that was I heard, saw that the Rogers um, uh, Rogers internet went down, and you're fr- frozen for a second now too. Um... Am I frozen? Oh, I'm going to turn my my face off and just do the voice yeah that's a good idea why don't you just turn the yeah yeah so this there we good. are but so yeah so rogers <laughs> went out um the internet service for for a whole day yeah. or, or something for all of canada yeah friday yeah friday yeah in canada oh it's such a monopoly okay mm-hmm. rogers outage our outrage between two suvs a chart chartreuse recumbent trike turned into dairy queen and pulled up by the mic After placing his order, the driver screeched out of the lane and drove right over the curb to make his getaway. Watching from the parking lot, I found his actions rash. Perhaps the Rogers network outage had rejected his debit cards and left him in a rage. I guessed he had no cash. Unable to call a friend, a nuisance. Unable to call a loved one, frightening. Unable to call 911, catastrophic. Unable to bank, a national emergency. No cash to buy our coffee. No cash to buy ice cream. It's terrible. Now we feel vulnerable. Where are the built-in redundancies? The almighty Rogers Network is brought to its knees. The more we learn of this disruption, the more obvious the question, 
whether it's time to consider the need to diversify Canadian telecommunications. Oh, that's great. And I, I understand your uh, play. We had, um, f- you know, but the reason why I didn't do this show earlier, you know, it was only two years ago is because we had no internet. Our internet was so bad. It was Frontier that owned it. And, um, and really, a squirrel would just run across the lines and the internet would go out. I mean, it was just the infrastructure was so bad. And I talked to the technician and they just had no motive. There was like no incentive. It's never going to get fixed. We have no incentive. We're just like leasing until it all falls apart is <laughs> what his ex- explanation was. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's no good having a monopoly over such an important utility. Um, well, thanks, Bev. That was a great poem. Good to see. Oh. Yeah, Canadications. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we only have three telecommunications. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Bev. Always great. Have a good evening. Yep, bye. Thanks, bye. Okay, and let's see if uh, Kimberly's back. I mean, um, let's see. Did we get this poem yet? We haven't yet. Um, let's see. Is anybody else going to pop on? I'll read, I'll read Ted Guevara's poem. This is uh, Not a Canzone by Ted Guevara. Um, and of course, as always, he has this photo. He loves including photos. Um, this is Ted Guevara's photo. Um, and that is uh, Jerry Seinfeld and someone driving in a car. I think there's a show. Does he have like, driving with Jerry or something like that? Let's see what the uh, poem is. This is July's Soul, and this is Ted Bernal Guevara. July's Soul. Let this not be an atheist prayer, but let biology be biological, as you had created it. The sense is as sure as daylight streaming around a sleek top-down jaguar carrying two Jewish comedians. Their success beyond the liturgy of what they have graced on us, on life. I thank thee for their galls and their wits, Let this not be their prayer, thin as they may shun it, malleable as it is now. Maybe the asking is tucked in their glove compartment. Suppression of their once feared lust has dispersed in the aged particles of space, I know. I breathe them too, inhale, exhale the thinning heavens inside a semi. There is always a want to be on this side, this land of far walls. A better life strewn with hope and prosperity the walls had promised. If only the doors would crack to let in a taste of this bendiness, this freedom, there would be humor then, a choice to shun or not. Atheists would be among them, but likely all packed their faith and had wrung every drop of their invisible sun. The two men basting in the coolness may have passed their locked vessel, the air in abundance above them. That was Ted Guevara's poem for this week, um, July's Soul. Excellent as always. Thanks for sharing that, Ted. Um, Somebody else came. uh, Let's see. Oh, here we have Kimberly. Ah, we have the poem. So let's go to Kimberly this time. Now we can see the poem as uh, as she reads. Hey, Kimberly. Hey. Good. I managed to get it to you. I'm so happy. Yeah, that worked perfectly. And this is Hippie Party. Is there anything you want to say about it before uh, you read? Um, Yeah. It, it it's not really following the prompt exactly or anything else, but it's just something I wanted to share. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I think of hippies as probably a, like a subculture, you know, that formed, mm-hmm. you know, in the '60s and '70s because they were kind of they didn't want to be like live like everyone else was living. And I think that there's a, a collective sadness in our in our country, mm-hmm. and um, there's a I get the feeling people some people have just given up. Yeah, yeah. And I think definitely. I think the time is ripe for subcultures to form. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as people try to be happy. I think so. Well, we've got one right here in the poetry community, which is always nice. Yeah. Um, Okay, let's hear this hippie party. Go ahead, whenever you're ready. Okay. Rain was threatening to wash out the road. A tricky, unmarked, muddy ribbon. The soggy perimeter of a cultish place called the People's Farm Space. An off-grid property filled with hippie imposters, long beards and dirty 
hair, clad in tie-dye, blowing smoke rings, making free love while gardening. A wormy compost of anti-war sentiment and draft dodging cowards. I studied maps to this secret place, having been invited to attend their hippie party bash. We arrived, the new couple, a curiosity to farm regulars who stared while I sipped a box of Chardonnay. My introduction began when my date stood up from the men only table. He announced laughing what a doctor whore I could be, grabbed me from behind, pumping me violently, a dry hump stunning. See, as cold and hot dishes crashed on the floor. People's farm members watched me crawl to the door, a shocked oval table full of your oldest man friends, felt guilt by association, loyal people's farm men. I stumbled off the driveway, tripped down a muddy bend, landed face down in a puddle when the raindrops spoke to me, warning of an abusive calamity formed of power, control, and hate. I drove off the property, spinning mud. I was looking for my date, plowing him down in a fantasy hit and run as I fishtailed through the gate. Oh, what a harrowing story. Thanks for sharing that, Kimberly. Really well told. Um, sorry that, that that all happened, um, but great, great poem. Thanks for sharing it. Well, don't don't assume things in the that first is true. Person. I know. You know, I know. Well, I, when he said that tonight, I was like, yeah. Well, it happened to somebody, though, probably. Yeah. Or things yeah. like that happen all the time, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Sure. Thank yep. you, Tim. Yep. Take care. It was Kimberly McNeil with Hippie Party. And let's go to, um, let's see. I think we might wrap up the show with that. We had um, Natasha Easton send a poem just now. I wonder if we should wait a minute and see if Natasha joins. Um, let's see. I don't know if I should share this. I always wonder if I should wait till next week in case they might be able to join. Um, yeah, I think we'll save the other ones for next week just in case. It's, it's so much better to have um, other people read than me. Oh, here's um, Nivedita can't be here for sure, though. And um, and she included this. Uh, let me get the audio for it really quickly. This is Nivedita's poem. Oh, and she included, okay. Let me, let's just do this. So Nivedita included an actual video. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh yeah, we'll go to Nivedita's and then if anybody if uh any of the other people who are here that sent poems share them in the meantime, I will do that. Can I play it? Let's see. Is it gonna work? It's coming. Okay, it's a pretty big file, so you're gonna have to hang on a little bit. There we go. Here it is, and now here's Nivedita. Hello. My name is Nikita, and this Pause is. It start from the beginning. Hello. Okay, let's uh, put this on screen so you can see. Got to get the right size. Hang on, sorry, sorry. Bear with me. Bear with me. We want to see Nivedita, though. I feel really bad that uh, it's such a bad time for her now. So let's get Nivedita on. Here she is. This is her confessional canzone. And here's Nivedita. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's Nivedita. My name is Nivedita, and this is my confessional canzone prompt upon fragile cast. Will we ever know? Will a day come when we know what life means? It could be today, or tomorrow, or perhaps even yesterday, and we failed to see, to know what it was life was really trying to explain to us. When we sat shedding tears over a lost life, when we danced gaily at your wedding day, maybe then, if we had thought hard, 
we will know, not will, we may have known what life means. But we lost those yesterdays and the days before and we lost our chance to possibly know what it was that life was trying to let us know. Perhaps when our life is nearing its close is when we will truly come to realize and to know exactly what it is life means. To us, I mean, for my day is not yours and my life is not yours. So probably that's the day when we will know what it is life truly means. Excellent. That was Nibby did a great, great scene, Nibby. That was uh, Nibby did a car, um, Karthik with a Will We Ever Know. Thanks, Nibby. Um, very cool to be able to play that. Let me see if... Um, yeah, let me see. If, okay, okay. So I think that's going to be it for the show tonight. We'll wait and see. Uh, so, some other people have sent canzones, but they um, um, are not here. And I want to give them a chance if they can be on like next week or something. Um, let's see. So um, so here's the Saiku really quick for this week. The, uh, the Saiku, the article... Uh, that this is based on. It was right here. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, you know, I didn't write a prompt poem, but at least I wrote a psyku. That's always good. So this is the article that we're talking about this week. This is. Um, let me just. Uh, yeah, we'll go like that. This is um, the importance of elders, and this is something that I thought was a. Uh, I thought it was common knowledge, that uh, I. I just thought we knew, and apparently it was a hypothesis, and we didn't really know. But the reason why it's a mystery that that we have you know, that we live as long as we do, that we live so long past um, our reproductive age. And um, it, it seems kind of clear to me, and it's been a theory forever, that um, it's because our, you know, our young children take so long to grow up that, that grandparents help with caregiving and help, help um, teach people lessons and skills um, that make the whole species survive. And that's why it's a fitness benefit um, to have people living well past um, the age of reproductivity. And this, this research out of the UC Santa Barbara this week um, actually looked at the caloric intake of different um, indigenous peoples around the world and, um, and, and actually measured that effect, at least as far as food production goes, and saw like what age they're providing more sustenance just by having grandparents than not. And so um, a very interesting study there to confirm a kind of a good hypothesis for why we live so old. Uh, whales are the same way, like orcas and other whales, um, and they teach each other to hunt and protect each other, and um, they, they live past well, well past f- fertility, too. So, um, an interesting article there out of UC Santa Barbara, and this was my Saiku for the week. And it reminded me of my, my grandmother, who I spent a lot of time with uh, when my dad would be off for business for a week or two at a time, um, and spent a lot of time with her. And here's my Saiku for the week. Grandma's Kitchen. Everything She Knows by Heart. Grandma's Kitchen, Everything She Knows by Heart. That is your Saiku for the week, and that is the show for the week. Um, next week's prompt is going to be right here. Um, write a poem about a movie you've seen the most often. Um, explain why. And so this was, um, you know, Troy only read one of his poems uh, about movies, but the book is full of them. Maybe half the poems in the book have something to do with um, a, a film of some kind. There's a long, the longest poem in the book is about um, the, the, the movie American Beauty, which is sort of central to the narrative that we were talking about, about happiness and um, in, in America and the, the way the, its place in our culture. Um, and so that's why this was inspired, this prompt, write a poem about a movie you've seen the most often. I guess you'd say the movie you've seen the most often. Um, if there's a movie you've watched 10 times or something like that, that's what we want to hear about. Um, and try as obliquely and interestingly as possible to explain why. Um, oh, hang on one second. We have another guest here. I think Natasha Navarro Easton is here. We'll see if we can get her on to do the poetry set. Hey, Natasha, how you doing? Doing great. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm just... <laughs> Um, trying to figure out this technology and I didn't know I could even chair today so I'm very happy oh no problem um, at all. yeah let's hear this poem uh, while we got you here um, this is uh, this is a uh, bitter melon and was this what was this about well um, this is actually it's it's pre-covid which is pretty crazy these days um, but it's kind of like it kind of it's kind of explaining the end of an era mm-hmm. you know um, in our lives just with this 45th president and all that. So yeah. anyway, this is the bitter melon poem. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay. In February, I was told 
if you have $325, an Eclipse Fest ticket, you will be sold. And you can come with, said my friend Caroline, to see a wonder spectacular, an astronomical event divine. Ah, no worries, I assured her. I have no bills. Rather be cool with you and co than face unpopular, pathetic, wastrel tills. I made my living dusting off pre course and gymnasium window sills. And then, despite myself, I didn't. Never forfeited half my check. Went to website, slightly appalled at the options. I could be dancing on the moon. I could have 17 acrobats on my back in tumbling towers. I didn't want EDM. I wanted a caravan of flowers and a pagan ritual rite in a special archaic site as if to embody a new chapter of Wind in the Willows. In tangential luminosity that would somehow teleport the innocence of yore to future times. Never the cold glow stick and shiny geometric spandex tights, but the whale oil lantern next to the anvil. Something of the labor of land and stream may it not be lost in this complete eclipse. Soulless are the fears I've heard spoken and expressed to me by that jack of cards, Lulu Loman, though his astro astrologer pal decent. He is telling everyone to stay at home and pray. For him, this might be Y2K. Weird way to warn me on OK Cupid. Still with experience of years before, I like you somewhat more, Lulu Loman, than the ever so much more sweet, drug hustling mechanic, so precociously wise and younger. And yet little do I know of bitter melon, though I suspect it's an ornamental vine I read about in fine garden and design. For that's the eclipse for me, a partial one in which one sees the rind, a last drop of bitterness, an observation of this partial life of mine, so I can forever leave it behind. For now, I may go forth boldly. I'll take out a $3,000 loan and live with roommates or alone. I'll graduate gladly. No need to see the stars come out in day. I am a star, though never named and put there by the gods. But here in a land tilled by hand and tractor, where the intelligent are not trusted, and the trusted are neither intelligent nor trustworthy, as the current head, but not mind, of this nation, we must burn bright, and the darkness last but three minutes. Hey, excellent poem. Thanks so much for sharing that. It's great you could join us. A first time uh, caller, too, that was Bitter Melon by uh, Natasha Easton. And Natasha, where are you calling from? Um, Chico, California. Oh, north excellent. of San Francisco. Yeah, right where yeah. Troy is. That's a good, good uh, a coincidence. Yeah, I know Troy. <laughs> oh, very good. Well, thanks so much. I'm glad mm -hmm. you could join, Natasha, and share that. Thank you. Yep, take care. Uh, how do I get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> You're good. Take okay. care. I, I'm just going to close okay. the meeting. Yeah, thanks. Okay, cool. Bye. Yeah, that was uh, uh, Natasha Easton with uh, a poem. It was great having first-time callers. Okay, like I was saying, though, um, the uh, prop for this week is to write a poem about a movie that you have seen the most often. So some movie you watch over and over again, um, write, a, uh, write a poem about that. That is your prop for this week, a much easier than one than the, uh, the canzone form. Um, any form goes, any length goes, um, it'll give you a bit of a break. Next week's guest on the Rattle Cast is going to be... Um, Anna M. Evans. Um, Anna Evans is uh, she's a, a formalist poet, she's a wonderful poet. She was a uh, um, ten years ago was the uh, Rattle Poetry Prize Readers Choice Award winner um, for Zietberger, um, a poem back then. Um, she's also um, been the editor of the Raintown Review, which is a formalist leaning poetry journal. Um, she has uh, two new books we're going to be talking about. Um, one of them is the um, this one on the screen here, Under Dark Water, Surviving the Titanic. Um, so it's a book of poems about the Titanic, which can be a fascinating topic to talk about. She also has um, um, the Quarantina Chronicles, another uh, short uh, chapbook, I think you'd call it, um, that, that just came out more recently. Um, that is Anna M. Evans uh, next week, Monday, July 18th, Rattlecast number 152. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great week in the meantime, and I will talk to you later. Goodbye. <laughs>